Good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to our seventh annual uh, SALT Summit. Thank you all for coming. Very excited to see you, and, and I'm very excited to get this going because it's been a lot of work for our staffs and, uh, and everyone else. Um, and it's also our second hybrid event. We like to welcome all the interested parties that are here in person as well as virtually. We are excited to be able to continue to bring this event to you at no charge due to the support of our partners and our sponsors. I'd like to, well, or like to thank our leading edge sponsor, Innovative Surface Solutions, our fleet sponsors, De-Icing Depot, Metal Plus, and the Fort William Henry, and our supporting sponsors, ADK Action, Branch Creek, Sima, Northern Supply, and Viking Size. So if we could all give them a round of applause for their support. Because without their support, we really could not be able to put this on as we do currently. Uh, I'd also really like to thank the Board of Directors of the Lake George Association for their continued support, belief in this program, and partnership with everybody. So a round for our Board of Directors. Um, a few housekeeping items we need to get through. Um, the bathrooms, if you go out the doors, they are to the right down the hallway. There will be breaks in between the sessions. We kept them short because we are pretty packed with content um, and they are on your agenda. We will be providing lunch and there are uh, snacks out in the hallway. It'll be a bagged lunch between 12 and 1230. And we all know we want to check our phones, stay contacted, but we ask that you really pay attention to the presenters because they put time and traveled to this. Um, but if you do have your phones, please make sure that they are silenced for respect for everybody. Um, and for our virtual attendees, I'd like to remind you to use the chat box if you have any questions that you would like forwarded or, or asked during the event, and we will be monitoring that. And for the people that are here, um, we will be having Q&A uh, after each presentation. So please raise your hand. We'll have staff on the side, but wait till they come with a microphone so that the people online can hear as well as everyone else in the room. Um, so as I said, this is our annual event. Um, it, it, it's funny because as we have grown and the event has grown and now we're virtual, you know, the virtual aspect is, has brought in some difficulties because we've actually tried to bring in more pre presenters and people now everybody can Zoom and they're like, well, can I provide a virtual presentation? Um, and, but we like to bring people here. We like to have them in the room and to be part of the networking and everything. So again, I'd like to ask that everyone respect and pay attention to the presenters because they have put an effort to come in here and, and provide this information to you. And we also love having the, the event here at the Fort William Henry. Um, hopefully you've all noticed about the, the renovations that have gone on. It looks really great and we are pleased to have Kathy Flack Munsell who is the CEO and chair of the board. Um, and similar to the way the fort has looked over the lake for I think 270 years thereabouts, the Flax have been part of this community from her late father who was a DEC commissioner to Kathy who has been on many state boards around the state as well as recently being appointed a commissioner to the Lake George Park Commission. So I'd like to welcome Kathy to the podium. Good morning, everyone. It is really such a joy to see all of you here, because we love to show off uh, what we have for everyone, but really because you are creating the community that really, really keeps all of us moving forward and having a good life relative to this lake that we overlook. You know, back in the day, the, the first hotel that was built here was built in about 1865, 1855, excuse me, and they chose the spot right. If you walk outside and look up the lake, you can see why. And you can also see why the British decided to build a fort because of, uh, because of the view, because of how you could see all the way up and, and, and 
take care of yourself relative to the enemy coming to you. But this meeting here today continues that protection of our area. And that is really caring about the water, caring about the foundations. And really, it's not, I'm the CEO of the company, but I assure you, I clean toilets and make ice creams every time it's needed. Because all of us go to that point of going to the where we need to be. So I thank you very, very much for coming here and committing yourselves to one of the most important assets in our area, in our state, and truly the smartest lake in the world that'll help other areas around the world in the future to be better. You know, when I go to places like Colorado, I am so sad to know they all have water problems. Well, you are making our water problems not happen and, and keeping us safe. So each and every one of you deserves a hero's uh, badge today for committing the time to understand and then putting your time into making it happen. So I thank you, I welcome you, and have a wonderful, wonderful conference. Thank you, Kathy. And I forgot to mention that she's also the chair of uh, the LGA's board of count, uh, business advisors. So also this year, we are pleased to have welcoming remarks provided by our assemblyman member uh, of the District 114. Matt Simpson has partnered on several initiatives to protect Lake George as a founding member of the Save Lake George Partnership. He recognized the importance of aquatic invasive species on his home water body of Brant Lake and helped guide the establishment of the first mandatory inspection program east of the Mississippi for Lake George. Further, and he's pushed that further in the Adirondack Park, he supported the Road Salt Initiative as a member of the Warren County Board of Supervisors and continues to support with the Randy Preston Road Salt Reduction Bill. It's hard to track Matt down at times as he's dedicated to working with so many in our district, but we are pleased to welcome him here this morning. Matt? Well, thank you and welcome everyone to Lake George. It's uh, wonderful to be here this morning. Um, you know, I find myself a lot of times starting out what I'm saying is, you know, we live in one of the most beautiful places in, in the country. I think we live in the most beautiful place. And the work that you all do is ensuring that that is protected for generations and generations. In my uh, prior public service, I was a town supervisor. And uh, one of the things I miss at the state is how quickly we can uh, affect change. We can we can actually have a positive effect in our communities without having to go through some of the things, the hurdles in, in Albany. But you all have that ability as local officials. There's highway superintendents here, town board members here, supervisors. And I think that's very powerful when you all can be here gathered in one room working on such a um, difficult issue as salt. Uh, you know, we know how difficult, how bad salt is. We just look at our vehicles after a couple of years. And uh, so we know what it's doing to our environment. And it's too precious to not solve this issue and move forward. So I want to congratulate you all and, and thank you all for being here working on this important issue. And uh, I look forward to learning about some of the initiatives that are, that are happening now. So thank you and welcome to Lake George. And uh, we'll see you later this afternoon. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Matt. Um, we'll now move on to our first presentation. Our first presenter is Jonathan Borelli, and he's one of the many researchers associated with the Jefferson Project, as Kathy referred to Lake George, is the smartest lake in the world, and that's due to the work of our partnership with IBM and RPI. John has numerous publications and applied network theory to answer ecological questions about community structure and dynamics. But he also has a project called the Dashing Gecko, which was interesting to find out, where you can actually purchase stickers of artwork of the various aquatic life that he has worked on and researched. So that's pretty interesting. But this morning, John will be presenting on the near and offshore chloride data that's presented from the Jefferson Project. So please welcome Dr. John Borelli.
Uh, thanks, everyone. Um, I see you, you visited my website. Uh, <laughs> thank you for that. Um, yeah, so I'm a, a postdoctoral researcher with the Jefferson Project. Um, mostly I work on modeling the food web of Lake George, um, trying to sort of understand how different organisms uh, interact with each other and how those interactions affect their long-term dynamics. Um, but since this is the Road Salt Summit, uh, uh, and I, I work a lot with our survey data, I thought I'd take some time to present a little bit about uh, chloride in the lake and what we've what we found uh, regarding that. Um, so just to start off with, um, in case uh, you aren't uh, very familiar with the Jefferson Project, we are, uh, as was mentioned, a collaboration uh, between Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, uh, IBM Research, and uh, the Lake George Association. Uh, and our goal is to use science and technology to identify human impacts, suggest solutions, and measure mitigation success. Um, to me, the, the Jefferson Project really has, uh, is, is, we're trying to answer three really uh, big overarching questions using Lake George as our, our focus. Um, and uh, first of all, we wanna know, you know, is the lake changing, right? What, what changes are occurring in the, the water quality, um, in the, the biotic environment? Um, and, and as part of that, really, how are the human impacts on the ecosystem being realized uh, in the lake? Uh, given that the lake is changing, we also want to know how can we best explain those changes in the lake? In other words, we're looking for uh, mechanisms, causes, you know, why are these changes happening? And the reason we want to do that is once we have our mechanisms, once we understand why things are changing, we can use that to make predictions about the future. We wanna be able to say, okay, if the environment changes in this way going forward over the next 10, 20 years, what is, that, what is gonna to happen to the water quality of the lake? Uh, and so for most of this presentation, I'm gonna be focused on this first question, uh, you know, is the lake changing? And to get at that, uh, at the Jefferson Project, we, we've got a couple of, uh, survey tools that we have, uh, data sets, to help us address uh, whether or not the lake is changing. Uh, in fact, there's three, really four data sets. Uh, the first one is an offshore data set, which is, was started in 1980 and is going uh, all the way to today. Started off with six deep water sites and moved on to 11. They're uh, in the open circles on the map there. Um, pretty well spread out throughout the lake. Um, and at those sites, we measure chemistry in the upper mixed layer uh, and down near the bottom of the lake. And we also uh, quantify uh, biotic variables like phytoplankton and zooplankton. Our second survey uh, started a little bit more recently. Um, it was a nearshore survey, uh, started in 2017, going till now. Uh, and there we sort of expanded uh, on uh, earlier work with the offshore survey. Um, and move towards uh, having a sort of a really widespread, uh, a lot of sites throughout the lake. Those are the black dots that you see on the map there. Uh, 30 sites throughout the lake, and there we measure water chemistry as well as biotic variables like zooplankton. We also measure uh, macroinvertebrates, the little insects that are living in the lake. There we go. Um, so I want to start off just talking about uh, some work we did uh, published recently on some of the long-term changes in the lake um, using that offshore monitoring program, uh, specifically focused on the uh, upper mixed layer of the water, sort of that open water area, what's going on in there. We've measured 18 different water quality variables uh, and we're using seven deep water sites uh, with the longest time record. What we've learned, uh, sulfate and nitrogen are decreasing. The sulfate is largely a, a because of the reduction in acid rain. Um, so that's kind of a cool result. Um, Secchi depth, which is the water clarity, uh, phosphorus, dissolved oxygen, and silica haven't really changed very much over the last 40 years. Uh, alkalinity, chloride, sodium, and conductivity. Uh, so you might be particularly interested here in chloride and sodium and conductivity. They're all somewhat related. Um, but those have been increasing the most. They have the, the highest increase over the last 40 years. But we're also seeing increases in temperature, chlorophyll, 
and orthophosphate, which is a form of phosphorus that is readily available to things like phytoplankton. Um, those have also increased, but not, not quite as much. Uh, if this is something that interests you, uh, I would. In this is where I, I have my plug for our data dashboard uh, that's currently up and running. Uh, you can find it at jeffersonproject.live. You can scan that QR code, it'll take you right there. But on that dashboard, you'll find information about the Jefferson Project and what we do. Uh, you will also uh, be able to look at real-time sensor information um, from our many, many sensors uh, active throughout the lake. Um, uh, you can look at hyper-localized weather forecasts. Um, the, the guys at IBM are really proud of this. You can get very high-resolution uh, weather forecasts uh, pretty much all, all around the lake. Uh, and uh, finally, you can look at some of the long-term water uh, quality trends that I, I mentioned, mentioned here. Um, basically, just take a look and see, uh, for all these variables, what does their, their change over time look like uh, on an annual basis? Um, and as part of that, it uh, sort of brings me uh, to what I want to mainly talk about today, which is, which is chloride. And I want to do a little bit more of a, a deep dive into how chloride is changing in Lake George. Uh, so if, you're, if you've been here before, uh, if you're familiar with the Jefferson Project or uh, the LGA, uh, you might have seen a graph that looks like this before. Um, just to orient you, because you're gonna see a lot of these graphs on the y-axis is chloride in milligrams per liter. Uh, and on the, the x-axis um, is time. So here we have chloride from all of our uh, uh, offshore uh, epilimnetic samples, that's the, the open water uh, near the surface, uh, up first uh, top 10 meters of the water. And what you'll notice is chloride has largely increased, as I mentioned, going from about 6 milligrams per liter to around 19 or 20 milligrams per liter today. Um, with some Interesting features in that that I'll, I'll, I'll discuss in just a bit. We also have data from the hypolimnion, which is near the, the bottom of the lake. So here you can sort of see a difference between sort of that upper layer and the bottom layer of the lake to see whether that chloride is pretty evenly distributed. And actually, you see pretty much the same pattern, almost exactly the same, really. Um, with just a little bit more spread uh, in the data. Now we also have shallow water samples. We have four shallow water samples from 1980 on uh, in association with that offshore survey. And again, we're seeing largely the same pattern that we see in the, off the, the deep water samples with just a little bit more spread there as well. And finally, for our nearshore survey, which hasn't been going on as long, um, chloride is roughly the same, at the same level as we see in our offshore surveys, um, with some outlier exceptions that I will talk, to, talk about in just a bit. <coughs> so on average, what, we've, what we can learn from these, uh, these different data sets is that on average, chloride is higher in the shallow nearshore areas than it is in the, the deeper water areas, but not by much. Um, we're talking like maybe half a milligram per liter to one milligram per liter higher on average. But it is a lot more variable in the shallow nearshore areas. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, here you're seeing the coefficient of variation, which is a measure of the spread of the data. Um, in the light color are the, the nearshore areas, and the darker colors, and uh, the, the, that lighter color is that, that shallow water sample, um, and the, the green and blue are the offshore samples. Um, and basically what that's telling me is that because that nearshore area is more variable, that's why we're seeing slightly higher concentrations there because uh, on average, you see higher highs uh, in the nearshore area than you see in the offshore regions. So one of, the things, one of the other things we can do is we can look at how exactly has chloride been changing. Like, 
what is the rate of change? And to, to get at that, uh, I fit a function using something called a generalized additive model, which basically just accounts for wiggliness in the data. <coughs> um, and I use that to determine uh, at each point in time, how fast is chloride changing? And what you see over here on the right-hand side, on the right-hand graph, is that rate of change over time. And for most of that period, it's increasing. But it's not increasing at the same rate. Sometimes it increases a little faster. Sometimes it increases a little slower. What's interesting is this period here. So starting in about 2010, where you see that gray line and red line, chloride is actually leveling off, actually declining a little bit. But then in 2015, and you can actually see this on the time series here, right around 2015, there's a jump. It almost kind of looks like a break if you, if you squint at it. There's that jump in chloride, and that's what, you, what you're seeing in this big peak on the right-hand side of the graph. So something happened in 2015, or something happened in 2014, uh, to cause that initial decline and then big jump. Um, I'm not entirely sure what it is. Um, but then starting again in 2020, that's when we start to see it leveling off again. Um, so largely, that chloride is kind of leveling off. Using a similar approach, I was looking at chloride in space. And for this, I used a, a method to interpolate our nearshore and offshore data. <coughs> Pardon me. And what we can learn from this is that, on average, chloride is higher in the south. But I will note that the gradient is not very big. It's about a 4 milligram per liter difference between the south and the north, which might be statistically significant, but is not necessarily biologically significant. And finally, I wanted to put chloride in a little bit of context. Um, so here, you'll see a graph with uh, two of the lowest uh, water quality thresholds for chloride, uh, Canada and the US EPA. Canada uh, guideline is 120 milligrams per liter. Uh, US EPA is 230. Uh, and so overall, uh, Lake George is far below the lowest thresholds for aquatic life, which is good. We do have one sample, which you might have noticed from that nearshore graph, that does come close. And that is a sample from East Brook in June of 2019 at 85 milligrams per liter in the lake. Um, we have never seen anything as high as that uh, before, and we haven't seen anything like that since. Um, I haven't had a chance to look through our meteorological data or our stream data. I, don't, I can't explain that outlier uh, just yet, but it, it could be a result of some strange uh, weather event sort of flushing a lot of chloride out of a stream. Um, but our second highest sample was about 35 milligrams per liter, and that's from Lake George Village in March of 2006, just to give a, a little bit of context there. So some of the takeaways for chloride in Lake George, uh, we do have higher and more variable concentrations in the near shore. We have higher chloride in the south than in the north. And then except for a jump in 2015, Chloride has largely been level since 2010. So, probably doing a good job, guys. <coughs> uh, I'm just going to finish up a little bit, talking a little bit about these second questions, uh, and then I'll finish up. Um, this is where my bread and butter is as a researcher, thinking about how we can explain changes in the lake and making predictions about the future. And for that, I turn to food webs. Food webs are models of, of who's eating whom in the lake, um, how the species are interacting with each other. And the, way, the reason I like using them is because they provide a context for how changes in environmental variables like chloride or nutrients or temperature how those environmental changes uh, propagate throughout the community and have larger impacts. Um, we get a lot of our information from running experiments, so I wanted to just highlight this uh, experiment from uh, 
a former postdoc with the Jefferson Project uh, who ran uh, multiple experiments in these mesocosms, they're large cattle tanks, um, 200 liters or so. Um, and they measured change in zooplankton and chlorophyll, which is a proxy for phytoplankton, uh, after one or two months. And they tested a range of chloride from zero to 1,500 milligrams per liter because they wanted to know sort of how does that increase in chloride impact the, the ecological community, uh, how big of a difference does it make, and importantly, how uh, good are those thresholds, that 120 milligrams per liter. And largely what they found is as you increase chloride, you see a decline in zooplankton, which are important micrograzers in the food web. They eat down the phytoplankton. And so when you lose those zooplankton, you see the, that green line increasing. That's an increase in phytoplankton abundance. Um, and uh, more importantly, uh, the concentration at which 50% of the population of zooplankton was lost, that's a, sort of an important measure. It's called the LC50. Um, what they found is that it's often close to the lowest threshold, that 120 milligrams per liter. It's sometimes below that threshold. So whether those thresholds are really great for uh, uh, protecting water quality is uh, an open question still. Um, other things we've learned from experiments, uh, the species present in the experiment can influence the outcome. Uh, whether predators are there, competitors. The experimental design can lead to differing results, whether you're using cattle tanks or in lake mesocosms. And then if you have multiple stressors, increasing temperature, changing light, that can also interactively impact species. So in my work, um, I look at the Lake George food web, which is actually fairly large and fairly complex. This is actually a, a somewhat of a simplification of the Lake George uh, food web network. The, it's a map of all the interactions between phytoplankton, zooplankton, macroinvertebrates, fish, plants. Um, and there's about 180 species in there with about 1,400 interactions among them. Well, what I can uh, gain from this, um, I've been able to use this to sort of build a model for uh, how the dynamics of these species go. And what I get from that um, I can actually do a fairly good job of replicating the observed dynamics. So here we have three different kinds of zooplankton. The black dots are our observations. The red line is what my model says their abundance should be. Um, and you can see that the model does a, a pretty good job of, of replicating that. And the reason that's important is because once we can replicate the dynamics, now I can start messing with it. I can say, okay, what if we increase the temperature? What if we increase the chloride? How is that going to change things? And so that, that's going to be one of our, our future goals. And so just to finish up, salt has increased in Lake George over 40 years, but it seems to be flattening. That curve seems to be flattening. The impact of salt on species in the lake uh, depends on the presence of competitors, predators, and other stressors. And we are working on incorporating experimental data into our models to make our predictions about long-term impacts of both increased uh, chloride and other stressors. Uh, and with that, I'll take any questions. Uh, Jonathan, that, that one chart you showed where there was a large swing 2010, 2015, big curves. Mm -hmm. Did you look at the amount of snowfall in those years to see if that may have had pl played a part? Because snowfall usually means, uh, we were do a good job here with it, but it usually means that the, there's more salt in the roads. That is a great question. I have not had a chance to look at that yet, but that is definitely the first place I'm going to look. Uh, it, there, there's a couple of explanations. It could be, um, you know, maybe 2013, 2014 was a bit of a milder winter. Maybe you used less salt, so maybe there was kind of a decline, a little bit of flushing, and so there was a kind of a downturn, and then it kind of normalized after 2015. Um, or it could be that that winter of 2015 was especially harsh, and maybe you had to use more salt, so it kind of jumped up a little bit. I am not sure what the explanation is, but we are going to look into that. 
Oh. But yeah, very good question. <clears throat> I could. Thanks, Jonathan, that was helpful. Um, one question, we talk about the lake and the deep water in the near shore and the higher levels in the near shore. What about the streams? Can you speak at all to the streams? Because our understanding is that's where we're seeing the real spikes, uh, well beyond you know, thresholds that we're concerned about. Uh, yeah, another good question. Um, so we actually, we do have stream data. Um, I have not personally looked at the stream data very much, um, so I can't speak to that right now. Um, I do know uh, Joel gave a presentation on stream data last year, which is online if you want to check it out. Um, but you're right, we do see a lot higher concentrations in those streams than we do in the lake. Um, and that is going to be, that is something that is, is very interesting um, because, yeah, those high chlorides, they can uh, influence what's other things that are coming into the lake as, as well. Um, so yeah, we, we are we are on it. <laughs> I know. Thanks. And if I could, John, sorry. As, as a follow up, excuse me. As a follow up to that, John, could could that explain some of the variation, you know, in the near shore data that you were just showing that, you know, there, there's higher concentrations near shore, and that could be the influence from streams. Yes. Possibly yes. So a lot of our, um, especially uh, the more recent uh, sites. Um, from 2017 on, a lot of those sites are uh, at the stream outlets. Um, so, uh, and we don't really time our surveys based on weather. So there could have been uh, surveys where we go out and immediately following a storm event or something like that. And that can strongly influence whether or not we're finding high or low chloride at those sites. Um, though I, I think it's actually might be a little less likely in that long-term data set um, because I think those shallow sites are not at stream outlets. Um, but I'll, I'd have to double check that. Any other questions? If not, thank you very much, John. Appreciate thank it. Thank you. Our next presenter, um, we will we'll have to say is our uh, our pinch presenter, I would say, because this was, uh, Bria Arvison is the manager of water quality research at the Lake George Association. I've been proud to work with her for the past uh, almost three years. Um, and if you ever want to know the name and species of an aquatic plant, she is the one to go to because it, it's amazing to go out and investigate the lake with her. Um, she is subbing for Dr. Jim Sutherland, a longtime researcher on Lake George for approaching five decades. Uh, Jim, unfortunately, and maybe you're out there in virtual world, I hope so, Jim, thank you for your work. Um, he, unfortunately, uh, tested positive for COVID and did not want to show up for obvious reasons. So yesterday we dropped the presentation on Bria. But she is well versed in the, this project, and uh, we are going to talk about the influences of salt storage um, through a project that we've been working on along Westbrook and around the village of Lake George wastewater treatment plant. So I'd like to invite Bria up for the presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Chris, for that, uh, that introduction. So Jim just wanted to make sure that we're, we know that it's the 50th anniversary of the Clean Water Act. And fun fact, it's actually the 18th is its birthday. So uh, in a complimentary fashion, this talk is going to be go over wastewater treatment plants, road salt, winter de-icing, salt storage sheds, and the potential for water quality contamination in the Lake George Basin. These couple of slides talk over kind of the history of when we started to realize that salt is a bad thing. So in this memorandum by the Division of Water, they provided guidance for preventing water quality problems from highway salting and mixture storage. And they made a point to distinguish between what storage is, the actual location of where we're keeping the salt, and where we're spreading the salt, the distribution. So at the time, DEC 
had limited authority to establish regulations, so this was more of a recommendation. Again, so they identified that water quality could be threatened by improper storage of salt and also from spreading the salt. And that also unprotected large storage amounts would exposed to high rain amounts or runoff can also leach into this, the ground and then also into our water resources like streams and lakes. Again, the absence of regulations, this was more of a recommendation. So John was talking about the lake-wide chloride changes and we're gonna dial it in right to South Lake George. And specifically looking at Westbrook, that orange line that you see, and also its impact from starting with the village of Lake George wastewater treatment plant. These studies started in 2014 and 15, and then there was a continuation study that we are currently working on starting in 2018. So to give you a little bit of background on Westbrook, it's actually the fourth largest stream that flows into Lake George and has over 5,000 acres of watershed. And looking at that watershed, you can actually see I-87 running through it, kind of towards the lake near that blue, that blue marker. 95% of the watershed is actually west of I-95. Most of it's forested, undeveloped, and all of the development primarily happens on the east side of that, of that watershed, or of, of I-87. In the beginning, in 2014 and 15, there were four stations starting from the lakeside all the way up into the watershed. So you can't really see it here too well, but they're marked one, two, three, and four. One closest to the lake is down in the, down in the village. And then you have Westbrook 2, which is west of 87, Westbrook 3, east of 87. I've flipped those. <laughs> <laughs> We're upside down right now. And then four is all the way up at Orbed Reservoir, which used to be the drinking water resource for Lake George. So this, this image just shows the direct, the movement of water, groundwater in, in the watershed, specific to the village, wastewater treatment plant, and Westbrook. You can see those white arrows moving through from the wastewater treatment plant, from I don't have a pointer to show you, but there's that little like baseball type thing looking like, that's a cemetery. Then you have the, the town garage, which is right to the left of it. And then you have all the hotels and the main strip happening all the way to the, to the left. And then, so looking at elevation changes from the wastewater treatment plant down to Lake George, you actually have quite a bit of a drop, which just explains why the groundwater is flowing that way. Can you go back a slide, please? Thank you. So this is showing additional study sites in the watershed, not just along Westbrook, but then also things influencing Westbrook. So looking at the two speedy wells at the top, kind of they have the two long yellow lines coming from them. Those are direct influences from the wastewater treatment plant. And then you have another well that's kind of next to that baseball cemetery type type looking thing. And that would be the town garage well. And then you have the two seeps that are the two main influences into Westbrook from this area. Seep one on the right and then seep two on the left. And each of those, because of the elevation changes, are directly influenced by those upper speedy wells. And this is just an image of what they look like. So on the left, you have seep two. And then on the right, you have seep one. So pulling, pulling from the studies that we're, that we're doing, 2014 and then the 2018 one, we're seeing a 28-fold in increase in chloride from all the way up at Orbed Reservoir down to Westbrook One in the village. So you can also see that there's kind of minimal influence from I-87 between Westbrook Three and, four, and Two. They really don't increase that much. So surprising enough, why is, why is Westbrook One increasing so much? 
So then we pull in the different concentrations from the other sites. We're looking at the speedy wells and the wastewater treatment effluent. Those are kind of the same, kind of the similar. And then we see seepage two, which has a huge spike. And then we have another, the next graph over on the right is showing the same two at, at the effluent and the speedies wells, but then seepage one. Seepage one is lower, not, not as much influence happening in seepage one. Just another, another look at all the different data sites. So we have the effluent and the speedies wells, again, very similar. The town garage, which was down in elevation from the speedies wells, and then seep two, which was down from elevation from the speedies wells and from the town garage. And then, so why is there so much salt happening there? And then you look at Westbrook one and Westbrook two, you see almost a fourfold increase from Westbrook one to Westbrook or sorry, from Westbrook two to Westbrook one. Now remember that map again, I'm not gonna go backwards. So you had Westbrook two was just to the west of I, or east of I-87, and then Westbrook one was below where seep two comes in. So looking at the potential for chloride sources in the Westbrook watershed, and the, specifically this area that we're looking, we have the village wastewater treatment plant. We also have the Holiday Inn parking lot and the town highway department building. So this, this slide Jim put together just showing the chloride load happening from seep two. So doing all the calculations from all the data that we're collecting, you come out with 56 tons of salt coming in from that one little seep per year. And then looking at like what those sources could be, the Holiday Inn and the Town Garage make up 31 tons of that. <laughs> and that's it. So any questions? There any questions for Bria? Hi, Eric. I don't think I need the mic. Well, you do. Yeah, we do. You yeah, do because there's a virtual crowd. Sorry about that. Great job, Rhea. Um, the question I have is knowing what we know about these, these, these um, increases in chloride closer to the lake, what do we do about it? What's the, and I know you're not Jim Sutherland, but I know you know a lot. So, and Chris can chime in on this too. So back to the memorandum, there was, we had salt storage, which was primarily in piles, and then sometimes there was a tarp over them where I think the town has done a great job of putting a storage shed together. So there is no impact from, from precipitation. And primarily this data is looking at salt storage within the ground, not necessarily what's coming in right off the surface. So we had all this impact and I guess basically packing in of the salt into the ground, and now we're, we're reaping the, the benefits of it. So we're seeing it start to leach out because over time, it's releasing into the, the streams. Is that okay? Yes. And I oh, would. I there's would, another question. Okay. Um, is there any impact in the study uh, as far as Route Nine, which is actually closer to the lake and also Westbrook as well? Is there any consideration on how the Route Nine is being treated? Uh, we've mentioned eighty-seven, uh, but I. I think there's probably uh, some some addition to, to this prep, to this uh, study uh, coming off of Route Nine. Do you want to speak to that? And yeah, yeah. Yes, Keith. Thanks. Um, Route Nine is not part of this study. However, um, we have studied that with the Westbrook uh, Stormwater Initiative. The studies that have gone on there that we monitored with the uh, collaboration in the reconstruction of the wetlands there. With that, we did monitor chlorides coming through that, and we put a report out a, a couple years ago. Um, maybe, thanks, maybe we'll put that on note for next year, but we did show that there is an influence of runoff from 9N that discharges into Westbrook, however, below where Route 9 is. So, so there is that influence um, and that is something, you know, we'll put in a note and, and maybe put that into a forwarding study. Going back 
um, to the previous question, and we we know that there is salt storage at the town barn, um, and they've had that in for a while. There's also the historical legacy loading that's been there, and we see that all around. A lot of that is evident um, because we, we see the higher concentrations a lot of time in chlorides in late summer, early fall, which is counterintuitive of what you would think when chlorides are being added during the winter. And that is the buildup in the soils and the groundwater that's been there. So there, um, the town also installed, did great work on managing stormwater. They put in a big infiltration basin up there with the Warren County Soil and Water 12 years ago or thereabouts. Um, but that stops the runoff, but it also puts it in the ground, which could lead to, to some of that as well. Um, so other things to study, but yes, there is other influences on Westbrook. So on this, this issue of legacy loading, um, and we know it's an issue, not just for, for chlorides, but isn't it displacing other things like calcium? which is having its own potential effects on the lake. So it's changing the balance, the natural balance. Can you speak to that? I think or I might Chris? defer to Chris on that one. Yes. Um, yeah, yes. Um, the, the, the sodium displaces um, calcium that's, you know, part of the soil. Um, and that's been studied. I, I don't have any data on that to to cite, um, there has been studies. I know Jim Sutherland um, and, and Dr. Steve Norton and, and Dr. Jeff Short put out a paper that they used calcium released from the soils to use as a chloride reduction model uh, to predict how chlorides could be reduced with reduction um, practices going on around the basin. So the, yes, calciums do increase as um, they get displaced by sodium and other particles in, uh, as, as road salt breaks down. Yeah, just following up on the salt loading issue, um, if, the, if the salt is in the soils and, and is leaching out, do we have any idea how long it takes for that leaching process to run its course, you know, which would then give us an idea whether there are fresh sources of salt or whether it's, you know, whether the problem is solved once it leaches out of the soils. So I think uh, yes, but no. So we would need to have a study area that would, that hasn't experienced salting in order to understand what that area's uh, refresh rate would be. And then also you have to consider the soil types. So different parts of the areas, this area around us has different types of soil, sandy soil, really rocky soil, that might have a different refresh rate. And to add, we just, um, I just referenced that, that one paper that Dr. Sutherland uh, had published a couple of years ago. That does get into the reduction of the leaching and how, and it, it was about a 20 to 25 year period. If we reduced road salt by 50%, which some towns have, that you would actually see that change coming out in our, in our streams. So we can provide that link if people are interested. Hi. <clears throat> I was just wondering if you measured uh, uh, chloride coming into the wastewater treatment plant? I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, yes, that is monitored. Um, and that's part of the, the, the requirements, the speedies requirements of the plant. I don't have that information right here, but that is monitored. Yes. So does the treatment, do you know if the treatment plant is adding some salt? I'm, I'm sorry. Is, is, it, is chloride, is the treatment plant processes adding any chloride? No, no, I mean, the, the chlorides are 
are, are part of the, the waste stream that's in there. I, to my knowledge, they do not add okay. any chlorides. Thank you. If that's all, I'd like to oh, thank for you. There are oh. more questions oh. in the comments. <laughs> I'll do my best to answer. It's not multitasking. We do have some questions from online. Um, we have a question. Will the town be using ARPA or recently funding to make improvements to the salt storage across the watershed and using those funds? I think that needs to be another you answer, Chris. Sorry. Um, I, I do not have uh, that answer regarding funds that would have to be directed, I think, to the town of Lake George. I know that there was some representatives from the town. I don't know if they're here to, to speak to that. I think that is all the questions that we had online. So again, thank you, Bria. Appreciate that. Um, our next presenter is uh, Michaela Glennon. Uh, We've seen the data presented by our scientists, but is that the only way the data and impacts to water quality can be expressed? Our next presenter thinks not. Kelly Glennon is a lifelong Adirondacker, and her work reflects an interest in the environment and also in the culture of the park. She is currently working for the Adirondack Watershed Institute. When I first saw the work that she will be presenting on, I immediately thought that it would be great for our SALT Summit and a different way to present the data and the way that uh, our water quality is being impacted. So I hope that you will think so as well. So, Dr. Glennon. Thanks, Chris. Um, I am the science director for the Adirondack Watershed Institute. <clears throat> Excuse me. And generally at this meeting, you would have either our director, Dan Kelting, or our water quality program director and senior research scientist, Brendan Wiltsey, who actually do the road salt research. We are, we are heavily involved in road salt research, but not me. I am, I'm a terrestrial wildlife ecologist. I am a scientist. Um, so I'm a poor replacement for either of those gentlemen, but I was, I was really happy to come. Uh, and talk when Chris asked me to, to come here and talk to you about a, a totally different topic. How do I go forward? There we go. So I love the surreptitious title that you put for me, Chris, on my presentation, suggesting that maybe I was going to show up and share some groundbreaking and elegant science and or some wonderful management recommendations, which is not at all what I'm going to do. Instead, I am actually going to talk about art. Um, and I'm going to talk in particular about a project called Wool and Water, with, which Chris saw me um, talk about at the, the meeting in the Champlain Research Conference back in May. So this project is called Wool and Water. It's a data art project in which we are using fiber art, primarily knitting and crochet, but some other things as well, to represent water quality, changing uh, trends in water quality and conditions in the Champlain Basin and in the Adirondacks. This was a bit of a crazy idea that we proposed to the Champlain Valley National Heritage Partnership as a small part of a small education grant and said, let's see what they think of this idea. And they liked it. And so two years ago, we started this project uh, with funding from the CVNHP, which does care about promoting the, the cultural heritage as well as the national heritage of the region. And it's been so well received that we have since that time been able to leverage additional funding 
from the Basin Program and from Northern New York Audubon uh, to continue this work. And so I'm, I'm thrilled to talk about it, even though it's a little bit out there <laughs> for this conference um, and, and perhaps different than what you were expecting. So I'd like to generally start this talk, one, by asking people who is a knitter or a crocheter, which I'm sure is almost <laughs> nobody in this crowd. All oh, right. Um, I'm sure if you aren't, that you, I'm sure that many of you know people who do. Um, but anyway, I, I do like to give a little bit of background of why, <laughs> why is my science and research organization involved in this project. And, and part of the way that I attempt to explain this is just that, you know, we, we sort of have this notion, I think that the, the neuroscience has advanced beyond this now, but we, we were sort of exposed to this idea that lingers, that, that we are either sort of these, these left-brained or right-brained types of individuals who are, you know, analytical people, which I fully would have put myself in that camp for all of my life since high school, um, as, you know, logic and math and, and research and all that sort of thing. Or you're on the other end of the spectrum and, and you are, you know, an artist and you're ruled by passion and creativity and feeling and inspiration. And, and there's sort of this idea that, that there's this giant gulf between them. And I assign, I'm a scientist, therefore I can't do art or I'm an artist and math is way too hard for me, for example. But I, I would argue that actually not only our brains, but we as individuals and communities function better when we sort of take advantage of both of those things. So this is Leah, she's the same woman that was in the previous slide. She works in our analytical chemistry lab, analyzing the water samples that we collect throughout the park to learn about stressors like, like road salt. Um, and she's also an artist. This is a picture she gave to me of her in the Arctic. She has conducted research in the Arctic and also in Antarctica. She's actually headed back to Antarctica in a couple of weeks. Um, and here she is in her beloved Arctic with her oboe because she's also a musician. She also does painting and block printing and all kinds of cool stuff. And there, for some reason, you know, she felt the need to bring the oboe to the Arctic and combine these two sides of her. Similarly, here I am in one of my beloved peatlands. I've been studying low elevation uh, boreal wetlands and the birds that live within them in the Adirondacks for two decades. Um, that's me wearing a pattern called the bog jacket. As soon as I learned that there existed a pattern called the bog jacket, I had to make it. Not only that, I had to put one of my target birds on it and then I had to take it out to one of my study sites and wear it because there's just something about combining those two, two sides of us maybe and being inspired by both of them. So I would argue that um, instead of thinking about science and art as these sort of widely disparate things, that, that instead maybe there is some kind of inspiration and magic that comes when we combine the two of them. And all I can say to attest to this is just that I get a, I get a more enthusiastic reaction to this project and, and, a, and sort of more understanding of what I'm trying to convey than to any of the hundreds of ecology lectures that I've given <laughs> the Adirondacks for the past two decades. So that tells me that you know, something is working out about this. So Wool and Water is a data art project, for lack of me knowing a better term by which to, to, uh, to call it. It is an exhibit. There's a whole bunch of uh, stuff in this collection now that's slowly traveling throughout the region in part support with support from the Basin Program. It is perhaps most importantly for us an education and communication tool. It is collaborative. I'll show you examples of pieces primarily that I have made, but I am slowly um, corralling folks to participate in this project with me and create their own pieces that become a part of this collection. It is therefore a network of folks that I'm dragging along <laughs> on this fun adventure with me. And I think one of my favorite parts about it is that it's bringing in a community of folks to participate in something that, that might be considered activism, but in a very low, <laughs> low pressure sort of way. So craftivism, it gets them to think about the environmental concerns that they are worried about and, and maybe sort of express those feelings in a way that feels maybe less intimidating than calling up your local legislators or participating in a march. Although my ultimate fantasy for this project is that we all create some piece that has to do with road salt or whatever our top concern is. And, then, and we actually wear them, take them to Albany and <laughs> knock on the doors and say the knitters are coming. I love the idea of doing that. <laughs> So the items that are in the collection are, are, are a, a bunch of things that, that really have to do with our best attempts to, to use, use this particular form of art to illustrate 
concepts in limnology, trends, threats, the things we're worried about, all of which help us to, to, to tell our story, which is that we care the most about protecting clean water and promoting healthy watersheds. That is the focus of the Adirondack Watershed Institute. So this is just a quick tour of the variety of, of things that are now, now represented in, in various ways um, in this project. And I'm gonna focus today on the pieces that have to do primarily with winter. There's just a few things with road salt. I'm constantly bugging my colleagues for road, road salt data and, salt, and chloride information that I can play with a little bit more than I have so far. But um, I'm gonna focus on the winter pieces because this is a, a winter issue that we're talking about. And also because I tend to think a lot about um, things like ice and snow during the winter months. And then when summer comes, I'm instead focusing on HABs and, uh, and aquatic invasive species and things like that. So we're heading into the cold times. Uh, and here's one example of those. This is a piece that I called the Champlain Ice Scarf. It is a representation of the freeze record on Lake Champlain. So you can get the data from the National Weather Service or right from the Champlain Basin State of the Lake report that they put out each year. They put this record in there this year. And this is just a scarf in which each row is a year from the beginning of that record, which I want to say is 1897 or something like that. Um, it's a white light color if the lake froze, and it's a bluer color if the lake didn't freeze. The one that I made is the farthest on the left, but other pokes have, have taken this up and made the Champlain ice scarf as well. Um, so you imagine if you, you held that one up, the one that's hanging over the fence at my house, if you held it up, the older years are where we have less blue and the more recent years are years um, where the lake more and more often doesn't freeze completely. And the one in the middle, if you look close in that picture, you can see the, the version of it that I made. There are some white beads on one of those sort of three you know, columns in that particular stitch pattern. That is a representation of if the lake did freeze in the years that it froze, did it freeze in December or January or February? So within that record, the lake is freezing less often than it used to, and it's freezing later when it does freeze. So you can make the ice scarf, you can wear it, you have your climate active wear, you can say, what a nice scarf. Well, thank you, actually. It's the, it's the Champlain ice record. Let me tell you why I have this. So that's one of, <laughs> one of my favorite things about this project. Uh, here's another one that has to do with ice. I am not much of a fisherman at all, but I, I can't bear the thought of living somewhere that doesn't have ice fishing. I just am so enchanted by driving around in the wintertime and looking at the shanties on the lake. And in my, my plans for retirement include taking up fishing in all, all of its forms um, because I'm a terrestrial person. I want to learn more about fish, but I really want to do a piece about ice fishing. Um, and so this piece is, is sort of read similarly to the other one. You, kind of look from top to bottom and left to right. And each of the holes is meant to make you think about um, a hole in the ice that you might use for ice fishing, but also a winter, um, in this case, since 1895 and going to present time. And the ones that are outlined in that blue embroidery are winters in which the mean temperature was above 25 degrees, which is the temperature at which ice fishing derbies or competitions often get canceled. Um, this is based on research from Leslie Knoll and her colleagues. They are at the Itasca Biological Station in Minnesota. They wrote this really cool paper about the impacts of a warming climate on the ways that we use ice, pond hockey, ice fishing, um, ice sculptures, all that kind of stuff. I couldn't find a record for the Adirondacks where anybody had, can had compiled together the records of you know, when ice fishing derbies got canceled, but I know it happens. I know it happens here on Lake George, for example. Um, and so I just took their threshold and applied it to the, data, the weather data for our region. And so again, this is just a, to make you see that, you know, the winters are, are putting at risk one of the, the cultural things that we care about here. Uh, here's another one is the snowfall record. So if you look at the climate data, it's much harder to find consistent patterns within the precipitation trends than within the temperature trends, but this is one of the stations within the Adirondacks where there is a consistent negative trend in snowfall. So that is the snow record for Mauna Kina, um, sort of right in the middle of the park. It's kind of, it's, it's a subtle trend, but it is a downward trend. Um, and I just put it on a, on a scarf, in this case, making sort of the background piece first and then adding the data. Again, you can imagine wearing this somewhere and 
straight up an interesting conversation with somebody about climate change based on your, your climate fashion. And the last few that I'll, I'll show you do have to do with road salt. Um, we have worked on road salt for a long time, um, not me, but my, my colleagues, as mentioned. Um, and part of that has to do with monitoring through our Adirondack Lake Assessment Program, which has tracked a variety of, of indicators in, in many lakes throughout the park for, for a couple of decades, chloride being one of them. These are the chloride data for Rich Lake, right in the central part of the Adirondacks, a lake by which Route 28N is, is really close and is um, one of the lakes in our long-term monitoring program where we do see a significant increasing chloride trend. I just took those data and put it on the back of a frog because <laughs> I'm a wildlife person. And so this is meant to make you think about, you know, the impacts of chloride on our amphibian populations. Of course, we know that there are uh, important impacts from, you know, throughout the aquatic food web and, and to human health as well from this particular threat. So that's my salted frog. And then last, I'll talk for a, a minute about Mirror Lake. I think you had the salt summit in Lake Placid, so everybody knows well about probably our, our research in Mirror Lake, but um, this is you know, um, among, I think it's the most heavily developed lake in the Adirondacks by, by some measures anyway. Um, it's a small lake and it has um, a variety of, of impacts. It's sort of the center of the town of Lake Placid. This is a piece that's, that's just showing the bathymetry of Mirror Lake rendered in these little crochet circles just for fun, but um, basically to mimic the, the ASRA's beautiful map there. But Brendan um, and his colleagues in, our, in our, our ALAP program have been looking at road salt in Mirror Lake for a long time and published this paper in Lake and Res Reservoir Management a couple of years ago, showing that the accumulating chloride in the bottom of that lake actually is, is interfering with the, the lake turnover process. And so the graphic um, on the top there, the, the highly colored one is, the, Brendan knows how to make these really cool graphics in R. I wish I could learn how to do that, but um, showing you the chloride levels starting in 2016 and going, I think it's 2020, um, and the, the accumulation of salt, the high chloride at the bottom of the lake, which actually is, is preventing the turnover. So the lake didn't turn over in 2017, 18, 19, and I, it might, same thing might have happened in 2021, I can't remember. Um, so the bottom is just me attempting to represent that <laughs> in fiber art. Just because I think these are beautiful diagrams on their own, but then when, if I can turn them into yarn, they're even more fun and, and people tend to, to sort of gravitate toward those. What you may not have seen is some of his more recent information, um, which is showing that the work that the, the town um, and the village of Lake Placid are doing to reduce salt loads into that lake, there's a variety of, of actions being taken. It is working. So this is one of Brendan's um, GAM models, um, and the blue is showing a significant sort of downward trend in the chloride levels in the lake in the last couple of years. It's still really high though. If you look at the bottom, he takes that same graph and puts it sort of on the scale of where we are, which is still up at 40 milligrams per liter, um, and where we would like to be, which is much, much lower. In 1974, I think the level was four in Mirror Lake. So Brendan and, and his colleagues are making recommendations now for additional work that would need to be done in Mirror Lake um, that could be instituted to get the lake maybe down to 10, which would be much more protective of aquatic life in that lake. So that is your brief tour <laughs> of the Wool and Water Project. I will say that I talked mostly about the winter pieces, but there's all kinds of stuff in this collection. There's other pieces too that have been made by people other than me. I'm, I'm primarily a knitter or, or crocheter, but I have a woman that's beading, needle felting, weaving, um, all kinds of, of really cool stuff that I don't know how to do, but I'm happy to learn. Um, it is a project that I would love to have more people involved in. So if you do do any of these things or know folks that do, um, I encourage you to take a look at our website. If you go to the AWI website and pull down our community tab, you'll see a whole page dedicated to this project and, and sort of more information than you probably would ever wanna know about all the pieces I just talked about. There's a virtual kind of exhibit there and a bunch of tools for how to get involved. If you know somebody that might be involved, there are data sets to play with, there are instructions for how to get started. Um, I'm also interested, if, if none of this is, is particularly your thing, but you know somebody that might be interested in the exhibit, I'd love to know that too, because we do have support from the Basin Program to, to travel it around uh, within our region. Um, if you're a scientist who has data set that you'd love to see represented in yarn, I'd love to know that too. And last, if you are a fiber, 
producer or NOAA fiber producer in our region. That's another thing that we're trying to do is to highlight local fiber and use it as much as we can in this project. Thank you. If there are any questions, yes, we have. Where can we see these? Do you, do you have an exhibit somewhere now? The next place the exhibit will be is at the Saranac Lake Free Library um, during the month of November. In the wintertime in January, February, it'll be at the Whalensburg Grange slash uh, Wickham's Garage, which is an art space near there. Um, it'll be at St. Lawrence University at the Brush Gallery in February, or no, March um, and early April. Um, other than that, I'll probably take it back to the Paul Smith Vic at some point this winter and, and anywhere else that, that um, any, anyone who's interested, we're sort of in a continual process of working with folks to see who might be interested. I think we did have a catalog cut or a, a, a cut sheet in the packet that we sent out to everybody or in the, for attending, so. Uh, I have a, a general scientific question. Um, uh, you and your colleagues, when you get together and you brainstorm, um, are there any concerns about uh, what's happening out west of the lakes and the, in Colorado and California, where all the they're 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 losing ground, they're dissipating? That that could possibly happen on the east coast because. I looked at your snowfall levels, and it appears that they're gradually going down. And that's what happened out in California. The snowfall levels went down, and their lakes also went down at the same time. So I'm curious if you and your folks, when you get all the scientists get together around the table, if you, if you have folks ever discuss that or not. We haven't discussed that specifically, although I share your concern and certainly reading almost on a daily basis about what's happening out there is really terrifying. I think we as an organization think a lot about, you know, climate change and what that means generally. I think our context in the Adirondacks is different. We have more water and more groundwater that maybe that that's not as much of a concern, but I, I definitely think that these, these broad scale changes like that are completely terrifying <laughs> to think about. And fire is another one that comes up often as, you know, we, we think of the Adirondacks as a place that doesn't burn, but you know, our, our summers are getting kind of dry. <laughs> and it's not outside the realm of possibility that we have some big, big changes like that. Any other questions? If not, I think, uh, thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you found that interesting. I did. And when I first saw that, um, I, I just said, I've got to get you to the SALT Summit. So uh, with that, we've reach our, reached our first break. Uh, we will be back at 930. Um, go out, make your calls, get some coffee, Danish, and we'll see you back in 20 minutes or so, thereabouts. Thank you very much. Thank you to all the presenters. I hate to break up the uh, conversations. That's often where the most uh, business is done. But uh, thank you all for being here. This is, this is always a great event. For those who don't know me, I am uh, Eric Sy, president of the Lake George Association. And um, I'm kicking off this next session with an introduction. Um, and I, I just want to preface this by saying what we do in these, for those who have been to these summits before, and welcome to everyone who's out there online. I hear we have over 50 people. Uh, I don't know how many states that translates into, but last year it was 14 states. So this thing is growing just as we want it to, but we start with the science and then we move into the solutions. And that's what this next session is about. That's the arc. Everything we do uh, is guided by science, and you heard some, some good science. It may have been too much for you first thing in the morning, but um, you know, here we are. We're, we're going to get into the funner stuff now. And it's my pleasure to introduce Phil Sexton for this next session of WIT Advisors. Many of you know or have heard of Phil, but you may not know what WIT 
stands for. It, it fittingly stands for whatever it takes. And, and I have to say, that is exactly what we've done uh, working with Phil and his crew these past seven years to make Lake George a tested model for what it takes to reduce road salt use. And we don't use the word model lightly. I just want to touch on that uh, in my opening remarks. But I first want to say we only got here with the solid partnership of our municipal leaders around the lake. And I'm delighted to see some of you here today. John Strau, uh, Dennis Dickinson was in the room somewhere. John Strau's town of Queensbury, Dennis's town of Lake George. If there are others and I'm missing you, raise your hand and I'll, I'll acknowledge you. Oh my goodness, of course, Steve Ramon from the town of Hague. I didn't miss you, but uh, I forgot you. And anyway, uh, starting with their co-signed agreement, it all began with a piece of paper like this one, um, an MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding, detailing the problem, the science again, and then committing to what it's going to take to solve the problem in practical terms. And if you can't do it practically, we're not going to get it done. So that's job one. That agreement laid the foundation for the Lake George model that we're sharing with you today and the extraordinary progress we've made to date. And the coolest thing, and I've heard this a few times in previous uh, remarks, is We've done this without new policies, without new regulations. I'm, I'm speaking about Lake George now. Um, how do you do that? What does it take? Well, what, it, what it's taken is partnership. Not just the partnership of the municipal leaders, but it has taken the partnership of all of you. So from those municipal officials to private businesses, some of whom are in the room, we heard from Kathy Munsell, CEO of the Fort William Henry. Uh, we have Vinnie Crescito here from the Holiday Inn, who's also on the Lake Georgetown board, and other businesses. It's a, it's, a, it's a deep and wide bench of participation that has got us here. Um, guided by science again, fueled by direct investment. Uh, the LGA has been the principal investor on the private side of making this happen over the past seven years, knowing what's at stake and that failure can't be an option and creating a can-do culture. And I think this is the critical piece. We have experienced over this seven-year period a culture shift. The culture initially was, I remember it well, Chris, Chris was there too, Phil, et cetera. It was like this, we can't do that. <laughs> we can't switch our practices, that's not gonna happen. Those very same people have been champions, and you're going to hear from some of them shortly, for what it is we've done with their leadership. And these are the elements of the approach that makes what we've done a model. And I have to say, quick aside, they're the very same ingredients, ingredients that produced the strongest aquatic invasive species prevention program east of the Mississippi, bar none, at Lake George. We did that through partnership. Thank you. We did that through leadership. We did that through vision. And it's a, it's a, a, a smashing success. Um, and what does that say? It says that purpose-driven collaboration works. It works for the health of the lake and our lake-based economy. You know, I, I, I say this a lot because I, I believe it in my bones and my soul. Teddy Roosevelt put it this way. The environment and economy are opposite sides of the same coin, no doubt about it. And in our case, that coin is Lake George, whose value is going to accrue or decline depending on the actions we take now together. It's going to take all of us to keep Lake George clear and clean, or wherever you are out there. It's not just Lake George. This applies anywhere. So as Phil and company will share, the economic case for road salt reduction is strong. It's well documented. You're going to see and hear about some of the numbers. And I want to shift just slightly to the, the LGA has something called our Council of Business Advisors. These are lead businesses 
across the region, around the, the lake, uh, Robert Niemer from, from Niemer, Niemer Motor Group is here. He's, he's a, a leader on the Council of Business Advisors. Vinny uh, Crescito, again, uh, from the Holiday Inn, is on our Council of Business Advisors. Who am I missing that may be in the room? If I am, my apologies. But it's a robust, strong group. Uh, and, and, and why are they participating? Because they know what's at stake. You know, the lake is the lifeblood of our regional economy. That's just a, a simple fact. So what we did, though, with the Council of Business Advisors is we brought the economic case for road salt reduction to the state DOT. And we have a great delegation here today. We're, we're delighted to have, to have you participating. You're important partners in this, uh, this pursuit. But we, we met with, we sent a letter to our, our DOT commissioner, uh, Dominguez, um, and we, we made the business case in a letter, and we cited the significant savings here at Lake George as the basis for comprehensive reduction statewide. And when we crunched the numbers, the estimated total savings for the state would be in the tens of millions of dollars every year, maybe more than tens of millions. We did, this was back of the envelope calculations. It, but this is the best part. At the same time, we're protecting our waters, and our environment from salt's worsening impacts. And they are worsening. The, the latest science, the, the story gets worse. The more we learn about it, the, the more serious the problem is, and the more serious it is for us to take action. So the commissioner's response was on point, spot on, and she said, and I quote, this is the message, the economic case, that resonates with the most people. These words, for all of us, should be heard as a call to action, requiring us to work together, share our proven approach in the region and beyond. You know, and it's the ultimate win, win, win. We're keeping our roads safe, and we are, no doubt about it. We're protecting our waters, and we're saving money. I mean, what could be better? Bottom line, the best practices model at Lake George can be adapted anywhere, as the need to reduce road salt use intensifies everywhere. So I want to thank you again for being here, for making our progress possible, for delivering on behalf of our waters, on behalf of our budgets, on behalf of our future. Thank you very much. Phil? Good morning. I was hoping for an eruption, Eddie Van Halen, so maybe next year, right? That was lame. <laughs> so thanks for having me. Uh, it's been a real pleasure of mine to, to be a part of this now for, this is our seventh SALT Summit. Eric and I were talking earlier, though. I, I got involved here with this over eight years ago. Um, and in some places, we've been working on this even a little bit longer. So this, this has been a near decade experience so far. And, and I think this year for me in particular, we have a lot of people that are, we're going to bring up on the stage here in a minute. And that's just symbolic of, you know, during our first summit, we didn't really have anybody to, to talk with as far as implementation of reduction strategy. So we've got some interesting skits for you today. So let's We'll consider this the, uh, the entertainment section of the event. So before we uh, do anything further, I just wanna call everybody up that we're gonna be speaking with today and then I'll give you a little bit of uh, context here. But Jennifer, uh, if you could come up. Jennifer's with the, um, with actually with the Fort William Henry with their in-house operation. Todd uh, is with Warren County. Come on up. Scott with Queensbury, town of Queensbury. You, you all can just take the seat right in that order. Uh, Mike from the town of Peru, and uh, Donnie from uh, Edinburgh. And we do have um, Mike Barber with, uh, with the Fort William Henry here as well, and, and we just didn't have enough seats, but we're gonna sort of tag team on that. And then Wayne with the town of Edinburgh, he's actually with you as well, and then Mark uh, with the town of Queensbury. And so while I go through the rest of these, um, uh, Tim and Rob, if you could come up and, and they're going to do a couple interesting things with these buckets in a minute, but I just want to give you a, a little bit of, of 
context on what's going to happen next year. All right, so a lot of you that have been to this before have seen a lot of these charts and data and, and a lot of the, the, the salt output collection that we've been doing over the years. And my goal this year really was to start to get away from that because the data is now starting to become quite a bit more consistent in that. When, when operations, when winter maintenance operations are following these SWIM standards that we talk about, sustainable winter management, we are seeing very similar results in reduction. So what we want to try to do is share this with you in, from the view of a five gallon bucket. And so a couple of important points I think to make first. I learned this years ago. If we can go back to that five gallon bucket, I swear I didn't touch that button. So we, so important to, I think one of the things that shocked me way back when, I'm actually a practitioner by trade. And, and at one point I was actually the largest contractor in the snow management business, the private side of the industry. There was a year when I ordered a million tons of salt. So I do, I do take this very seriously. And back then ordering that million tons of salt, I had no idea that it only takes one teaspoon of salt to pollute five gallons of water. Any idea how many gallons of water in Lake George? I know Chris knows this. 550 billion. 550 billion uh, gallons of water. So when I did the math though on the amount of salt that's actually applied in the Adirondack Park alone, which has been studied extensively now, we think it's somewhere near a couple hundred thousand tons a year. Um, Eric, I think you've mentioned just in Lake George alone, it's about three miles long of, of uh, rail cars, right? Correct. Yeah, so that's a lot of salt. Um, but if you think about it in those terms, it would only take about 20 years if all that salt got dumped into Lake George. And we've already been dumping a lot of salt, right? So it doesn't take that long, it doesn't take that long. I actually did the math for Lake Champlain. So I mean, we, we think about this entire watershed as the Lake Champlain Basin, it would take about 220 years is the math that I came up with, actually with my daughter the other day, and that sort of shocked her. But if, again, think about how long we've already been applying salt. So we're already in, we're already like less than 100, 150 years, that kind of thing, right? Okay. So the economics of this though, I think are, are just as compelling in that that same 193,000, 200,000 tons of salt just applied in the park each year, never mind the state, uh, that would equate to a $12 million savings if we could reduce it by the amount that we've been able to reduce it here in Lake George, which is about half, okay? Some are a little bit less than that so far. Some are actually quite a bit more. Some are in the 70% range now from where they started five, six, seven years ago. And so think about it in terms of five gallon buckets. And this is really what I want uh, Tim and, and Rob's help to do is, Rob is from the town of Lake George and they were the first swim certified uh, town really in North America, never mind in this basin. And then Tim and his uh, partner in crime, Matt, who's here, uh, they soon followed a year later is, uh, following these practices. And Something that occurred to me is these guys and a few others started equating the amount of salt that they've been applying then and now to five gallon buckets. So these five gallon buckets, essentially, uh, they represent 50 pounds, okay? And so if you think about it in terms of when we first started our work here, this is, this is generally how much salt we saw going down on a lane mile of road. So a lane mile of road is, one mile, one direction, okay? A center lane mile is both directions, okay? But we're talking about one lane mile of road. We were seeing back eight years ago, sometimes a thousand pounds, but a lot of times 600 to 800 pounds. So that equates to this number of buckets, okay? And you'll understand why there's different colors in a minute. You could probably already guess. So what we wanna sort of apply to this though is what I've sort of, I just came up with this term a couple days ago, but when we, when we take the science, so this is very much a science-based initiative, but apply the common sense that I've actually learned from, from all these folks over the years, uh, not, not just from my experience, but every year I learn something new from these folks as well. So we're sort of learning together. But when you, when you take science and common sense and blend them together, I like to call it common science, and so I'd like to 
to have Tim and Rob show you from the view of a five gallon bucket where they started and where they are today. And this is really, this is the opportunity that we all have. So let's take it away. I, I will preface, we just, we just rehearsed this for the first time last night. We had no idea what we were doing last night. So just, just roll with it. <laughs> okay, it well, I'm down. glad you have notes because I don't. So anyway, let's, let's take it away. How you doing all? Welcome back to the, the SALT Summit for the seventh annual SALT Summit. Um, we promised you that we were gonna do liquids and learning better than anybody else that we've done from previous years, but we're gonna put that on hold and save that for next year. Like Phil had mentioned, the common science, Eric Sy had mentioned a community, a network, a change of culture. So what we did is we would go out and explain how this system worked. Um, I gotta go to my cheat sheet here. Uh, <clears throat> Because of this program and this base model and how it works, we had five states, seven, seven other counties, and four communities that were willing to work with us that are up here on the panel today. That's gonna be our success. As Rob taught us, my mentor, <laughs> uh, we're passing it on through a cultural change. And we always talked about the simplicity of the science and how we were gonna learn how to make this program work for everybody because the shock of it all is it's just too much, it's too complicated. So with this model, we're hoping to break it down so everybody understands it in a basic and simple way. It takes away the second guess from the alternative driver who doesn't want to switch and try to make a change. As Phil mentioned, this is what we started out with. Rob's gonna go through a procedure with the buckets and show you how we're gonna end with this model. Rob? All right, well, let's kind of break this down. Like I told Tim years ago, you're making it too complicated. So, which, if you've ever heard Tim, he overthinks a lot. Uh, so the first thing, I'm just gonna start subtracting buckets. Community, what's your neighbor doing? Well, this is great. You tell me you're gonna save a bunch of money and I'm gonna reduce application rate, how? Once you do that, and you guys start to say, okay, we can do better. People are watching. How do we do that? We got a reduction. The next thing's education. Well, they're showing us how to do different things and telling us different things, but let's go on the internet, um, find manuals, find all the information that we can on our own, through our neighbors, through our community that we have established. And through that, we're gonna reduce more. Next thing is calibration. Through calibration, um, one, we're gonna figure out what those, act, those notches on that dial actually mean. Uh, if, am I putting out 100 pounds on setting one or 200 pounds at a certain RPM? And it gives us a baseline, okay? This is where we are, this is where we're gonna start. And once we find that out, we can, we can go from there and do better. We reduce more. Then we start getting into tech, um, computerized application systems, uh, ground temperature sensors, and through tech and ground speed and GPS and everything going off of ground speed where we take it out of the driver's hands and we use a computer to put the same amount of material down all the time. With that, we're going to see another reduction. Then we're gonna talk about some sort of live edge plow. Um, many different brands out there, but the more material we can remove from the roadway, the less material we need to put on the roadway. And then we start into liquids. And liquids is a, a whole nother animal and you can go as far as you wanna go with it. There's different additives, there's um, anti-icing, uh, direct liquid application, pre-wetting. And again, you're gonna see reduction down even further. And the last thing is uh, cameras and knowing where you are 
um, now that you've, you've got this information, you know, taking it and applying it. So you're going to see another reduction. And now we're left with what we'd like to say 50 pounds a bucket, roughly. And for the most part, that's a very general how we're getting where we are through community, through technology, through partnership with our neighbors. Um, you can really knock this down without overthinking it. Um, any recipe is going to work for a different situation. So we've managed to bring it down to 100 pounds a lean mile. For one lean mile, it's two five-gallon buckets. When weather conditions change and we're dealing with freeze and rain, we add a couple more buckets. It's all about road safety, road safety and better management on your application rates. Once the drivers understand how much they've been wasting and they're still getting the same effect through all the technology and understanding the science behind what they're doing and just keeping it simple. Now there are certain situations where you will get back into a, gri uh, a grit, a grit, a friction adder, uh, an aggregate. Um, those are your ice storms. It's kind of no holds bar. You need to make the road safe. So you may need to add an aggregate to make the road safe. Um, but for the most part, you can see major reduction. Any questions? Because I was only given 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> you can have some of mine. Go ahead. You said you're down to 100. What was the starting point number? Uh, we started out uh, on an average of 400, just to see, of straight salt, just to see the average and the pictures of what's taking place. And then by playing with the system, as we mentioned before, we've seen the pictures with the, the technology that we have out there and that there's no difference between 400 to 200 to 150 per lane mile. And we're still taking the same effect. We were also, be able, to, we were also able to start seeing that by reducing these numbers, and having the actual data, we were seeing what we were actually wasting. So when a driver is interactive and he has the, the technology there before him, he can understand what he's wasting. And what we've taught to other surrounding towns without the technology, and then they were just starting to build their own bases, they were actually able to see it. Now they're, they're, what they're saving, they're rolling back into their newer technology. So this way they can have all that availability. With the same budget. With the same budget. With the same budget. Maintaining that same budget is important. Don't think about it as saving money. You have to roll it right back into your budget to continue um, road safety, better winter practice management, and it's all off of this blueprint. Matt. They, that's how the town, the towns now could pay for it. All them red buckets that they're going to save and by adding the technology with the initial investment. Uh, it, it comes back around, and not only is, does it come back around where you can afford to do the new technology, it comes back around, you're also saving the lake. Yes. I think, I think uh, one important material to, to include in this is, in the beginning, there was quite a bit of sand that was, that was part of this, right, guys? Yes. Correct. So, so where, where are you with the sand now? Little to none. We don't use it at all. You don't use it at all, okay. When it comes to anti-icing, we roll out on the roads, we put down a, a granular base. Um, we watch our weather, we have our weather cameras out. We try to roll out just before the storm. Some areas you really can't do it because you have a higher concentration of traffic. We're fortunate enough to where ours is minimal, even though it's a bigger area. So we're able to control our spread and our bounce. We put the material down at 100 pounds a lane mile. We try to keep everything within the center of the road. And as that freezing rain comes in, it turns it right into brine. If you're going to use a brine solution, it's already diluted. So by the time rain hits it, it starts dissolving and it causes ice. And it's a problem, it makes a mess. That's when you start incorporating your sand so you get your friction for your traction control. Um, with the technologies and the live edge plows that we have out there, by doing this preventative measure, 
these live edge plows are able to scrape that ice off. You can look at the roads, literally look at the roads and you think, oh my God, they're sheer bottles of ice. But when you drive over it, you're actually breaking through it. So again, educating <clears throat> the residential community, let them know to slow it down. It's three quarters of the problem because they're promised all the anti ice control, traction control in these newer cars today. It's a myth. Um, use your local newspaper. This is, these are our practices. Please slow down, please stay back. All these little things. And all that information that we've learned, we've passed it on to four, four successful towns, four successful counties. Um, and that's our success, starting with Rob Fopolis from Lake George. Thanks. Sorry. Passing it on to others, as he did for us. It's, it's really a shift you come from being reactive to being proactive, whether it be to going to other towns and, and sharing that information or anti-icing and getting out before the storm and putting a little bit out before the storm and preventing that bond. Um, so it's really being proactive in this whole initiative. So we have time for one more question and then we're gonna move on to the panel because we, uh, we've always joked that it's, it's, it's been sort of the, the Lake George Hague show for a while, right? So we're, sure. we're sharing the wealth now. So one more question. Tim and Rob, my question for you guys, when you first started this, how long did it take you to get down to the 100 pound? Mm. Good question. Hmm. I think for us, we were able to achieve it faster because we already had somebody who was more experienced training us. So we were able to do that within three years. It took me a lot of time, a lot of education on my own, um, with the backing from the town to, to actually do the research and to be able to implement that without having really anybody in the area to go to. It took me longer. Um, I was, I was a couple years to get myself as a plow truck driver down to those numbers and then to take my guys and then start to help them to reduce their numbers. So, but I was actually able to help these guys as my guys were achieving those lower numbers to actually achieve that even faster. I, I think just to add this, I mean, the, the way that we talk about the swim standards is you start with measuring calibration, prevention of the bond, then you get into this improvement, analysis, improvement, optimization process. And that, that, was slow to, that was slow to move um, for some time because there's, there's a buy-in issue, right? I mean, we, we joke all the time. When I first met Tim and Matt, um, I thought you guys were gonna kick me out of your shop, but so it, it took some time to gain some trust on this, right? Because it, it's new, it's new. It's, 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 a, it's a shift of mindset. It's a shift of methodologies. Um, but I think to, to Rob's point, you could easily overcomplicate something that's really not meant to be complicated. So that's why I go back to the common science sort of approaches. There's a lot of common sense that that's what I want to start uh, sort of having sharing with you next is everyone has an opportunity to start somewhere, right? And so um, guys, if you wouldn't mind, um, we'll take the buckets out of the way now. I need them back. This is why I collect maple syrup with too. So I need them back. <laughs> So they got pulled out of my sugar shack yesterday here. But um, so I'd like to start uh, with with Jennifer and, and Jennifer, I, I sort of forewarned you yesterday, but I'm, I'm giving Jennifer the no excuses award because what you're what you're seeing in this picture is uh, not only did the Fort William Henry uh, have was in your purview, but you, you also had the Best Western, which is down the road. And. I tried to get it at an angle, so there, there's like this consistent 30% or more grade that's a little hard to see in this picture, but it's an uphill grade that Jennifer decided we need, we need to start using brine, right? So why don't you, why don't you take the story from there? <laughs> so yes, last year was my first summit. I came because nobody else from our maintenance department wanted to come, so they sent the administrative assistant. So here I am. <laughs> so. Knowledge is power, is what I keep telling the guys. They need to come over and listen to this. Um, I was caught from the instant I wanted to learn how to do this on our property. And yes, I brine the best Western Hill. Those that drive by it know that it is a nightmare every snowstorm. So I was pushing that little walk behind up and down the hill all winter last year. 
Good proving for you. the point to the guys that yeah. if I can do it, there's no excuse. You can get out there and do it. So that picture you saw, it's a, it's a 12 gallon uh, walk behind backpack powered sprayer uh, or not ba uh, battery powered sprayer that, you know, so think about uh, salt brine itself actually weighs more than water. So it's, it's closer to 11 pounds. So think about it in terms of that. So she's pushing over 120 pounds until it finally gets emptied out. Right. But I just want to give you a lot of credit that that's you didn't you didn't let that get in the way and i think i think it's either a willingness or a budgets or a combination of those things that sometimes just stop us in our tracks right away so we said hey you know what we don't have the budget right and so well what what could we afford and so we so made we made it work yeah amen mike uh you're here too what what would you want to add to this story and, and where do you think you're going next with this i think might have bailed on me. Oh, we did? Okay, why, why don't you go ahead and... Um, so our goal this year is to try to get a bigger unit to either attach to our ATV that we have on property or even install in the back of the truck. Um, we did last year hand brine some of the major walkways and um, the parking lot by hand. So by it's hand. doable. It's definitely doable. Can you talk to us a little bit about the chloride free that you experimented with? Um, we use that on the major um, entranceways to kind of save on our newly renovated uh, tile in the hotel. It, it worked amazing. Um, it saved the concrete because um, of all our sidewalks are concrete. It didn't cause any erosion, less uh, tracking into the hotel of the rock salt. Um, it's, it's working so far, so hopefully we can go a little bigger this year and and make it more presentable. I'd love to see some of these other hotels catching on to this idea. Um, I'm born and raised here. I want to save this lake. Amen. And I, my understanding, the quarry for you're using the, the potassium formate based product. So just for the folks that need to sort of know what that is. So it's a, it's a non chloride, but it's potassium formate is what you were using. Correct. And you know, one of the other benefits I think we saw was the tracking of all that material into these buildings that that it just causes you other grief as far as the cleanup. If you think about rock salt, that's like hundred grit sandpaper. That's 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 wearing on your floors. Yeah, yeah, the new floors, the carpet, it just breaks down everything. So yeah. Cool. Anything else you think we should know? No, just do it. <laughs> just do it. Love it. I should I should have made it the just do it award. So okay, uh, Todd, you're up, man. So. So if you haven't guessed, I've, I've, I've given this sort of a thematic tone. So everybody's got a little bit of a theme to theirs and, and we're calling Warren County scale, right? Scale. Uh, yep. That was my, my theme that was given to me. I didn't get to pick it just to let you know, but we're going to go with it. Uh, is in as a highway manager, Warren County, obviously I'm in charge of is like a lot of the superintendents are ordering the salt, making sure it's applied in which way it's there. And I want to say scale. That's how everything is measured. It's, it's through scale. We order the salt by the ton. It is put on the roads by the pounds per lane mile. If you're going to the brine, that's a gallons per lane mile, but it's also very easy to work it way back is to you know what you're putting down for pounds, all right? So it, it, getting with the theme with scale, that's how we're gonna measure everything. That needs to be, I, I wanna say, what's kept track of and uh, keeping all that, and it's in a spreadsheet, which I do at the county, and track every storm, every truck, how much is ordered, uh, it, it, and, and we get down to the scale. Now, as it was mentioned before, the trucks are all calibrated. They have a certain rate that goes out, and calibrating is measuring it out and scaling the amount of salt that comes out. Now, part of that is always getting it verified some way, and that, that's something in the county, we look at always different ways to verify that also. There's always a discussion that goes on between your driver that'll tell you, yeah, yeah, I, I put out 200. You told me to put 200 out, I put the 200 out. Well, you take a truck, and luckily for enough, right across up in Warrensburg, they'll let us use the, the scale that they use as the trash station for what they weigh for the containers. Put the truck on there, and it gives you the amount. And you say, there's no disputing it. This is what the scale says. You can tell me what you put out, but this is what the scale says. And uh, like I said, it, it comes to going to scale. And when we look at scale, and we're always looking for a reduction in salt, it's, it's, it's a scalable amount. Now, obviously, we are, we're going through a start of a process here. 
Uh, at the county, we're working on it. Uh, we took a look at what we started out as far as brining the roads and getting an application rate that we were comfortable with, which worked. And obviously taking a look at it, we scale. Uh, the, the use of the brine compared to changing what amount of salt's putting on the road. So as we go through the process and I take a look at it, obviously you learn uh, how much you're saving and there's a saving. And when I say when, it, when the scale tells you that and you can't dispute it, and here's where another part of the scale, kind of a, a word play on it is, you take that part of the operation, you scale it up. So where we were doing, we were doing a couple of roads in the county. Now our goal is to do 100 lane miles for this year. Also last year we did a little pilot program as to not putting any rock salt or salt on the Betty Lane and the beach road and going just to a brine application for that. That's still a work in process, but then again, we're gonna look at the scale on it. Uh, the other process everybody has mentioned here previously also is your live edge prows, cleans the road off. And again, it's a matter of checking how much salt is used compared to how much it saves you. And if it's beneficial, scale it up. That's what we're always looking for. We're looking for that scaled up. Now the county, I'm also asked to mention the fact that we have a Brian X machine that's on loan to any municipality if they'd like. Uh, it also goes to Washington County. They use it also to make your own brine. So there's something, if you're looking at an excuse for cost, it's available and it's a trailer and we'll provide training for it. Also, we have as far as uh, any application goes, uh, WIT has always been there to help us out with tracking our salt also. And when I say we're using scale, uh, it's always nice to verify. You can always check and they'll tell you what you're putting out, but in the end of the day, you know what you ordered for salt too. So use those scales to check at all times. Um, and, and the way I think to mention in the, in the first bullet here, the, the way that you're measuring now is it's automated GPS enabled salt tracking. It's actually measuring, it's metering. So it's measuring revolutions and that's, that's the way that we've been able to automate it and then actually verify it, you know, uh, compared with the controllers as well. So, so we sort of have like duplicitous systems that allow us to get, you know, full accuracy. So that's a great point. Yep. Awesome. Anything else you think we should know, Todd? Uh, I don't believe so. I think I hit all the points on the bulletin, on the bullet. Yes, did I say? <laughs> well, I don't want to keep you to just that. Close enough. Though I have one question maybe for the group because you mentioned the brine sharing. So, and, and we've been discussing a lot um, the idea of a brine co-op. So how, who, who's able to share with you or how's that, how's that actually been organized as far as, is there a limitation to who or... I don't How, believe there's that? any limitation. It's just yeah. whoever is asked. So I would, I would think at some point we're going to have a capacity issue, though. So, Chris, I think you had a point on that. Uh, yes, thank you. I actually had a question from the, the chat box from the online folks, oh, and it kind of rolled into that. There was a question, what about private plow companies? Is this information being passed on to them? Yeah. I would have thought that's, Debbie, if you're in the crowd, I know you are, I would have thought that's your question, but it must not be. <laughs> no. Nope. So. That was from Amy, so. Yeah. Well, I, so I think maybe I should answer that in that, you know, I think, I think the opportunity short term is we've got enough brine making going on in the basin. It's, it's really going to be a question of how do we distribute that, right? And, um, and there's been a lot of discussion on that as far as whoever's making the brine, um, if it's either sold or shared um, or loaned, however you want to look at it, um, is there some sort of a liability issue that's tied to that that we're going to have to answer questions to? I think so. I think you know that's that's one one of our major goals in our work with the LGA this year is to really start to to figure that out. So, but I think in the short term, what we've been able to do is really in, in almost sort of an old-fashioned barter system is we've been actually just pulling brine from you know where it's being made now. So, good question. Uh, Scott, you ready, man? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Scott's my new best friend, by the way. <laughs> uh, Scott Rowland, Connor Queensbury Highway, uh, working supervisor. Courage. Um, I had guys that have been there for 30 years, and I've got guys that have been there for two years, a year. So just to try to get the guys, the older guys, just to 
get into what we're trying to do uh, was hard to do. And uh, we started two years ago, right? Right. So, yeah. Uh, we shifted from the 50-50 uh, to going to straight salt. Uh, basically, we had our doors open six inches. We dropped them down to two inches. We've already got a reduction. So uh, that's not even trying. That's just switching. Uh, calibrated a couple trucks. Uh, we, obviously, we still have to do some more. But uh, it was just a matter of doing it. Uh, that's what she said there. Uh, just do it. Just do it. I mean, I talked to Rob. I met Rob before I met Phil, and then I met Phil, and talked to everybody. Sorry. <laughs> uh, and then talked to my, or so my, 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 my bosses and uh, moved, on, moved on from there. And can I insert yeah. some candor yeah. on this? <laughs> right. So I'm with you, Scott. Um, so think about this, though, for a minute. So just do it. 50-50 mix, sand salt. Um, isn't as easy as it sounds if you want to think about it in terms of, well, but wait a minute, I've got a, I've got a resource, I've got a huge investment in sand processing uh, that, you know, like how much did you guys invest in that, I think, at one uh, point? Mark? Uh, yeah, Mark. We just bought a brand new screen uh, yeah. two or three years ago. It was almost $400,000. So it's... it's and that's sort of the point. Is, is that is that the right number, Mark, or what do we think? Yeah. Okay. Good answer for you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, it's not just the equipment. So, that's just the that's just the screen. That's not the man hours to make the screen, to make yeah. the sand, the loaders, the trucking, uh, the picking of it up, uh, and we have two thousand catch basins within town, Mark. Uh, that we have to clean every year. Uh, and putting sand down just is more work for us. And uh, we equated that to about 70 grand in cleanup, I remember when we were yeah. together, right? We have, we have four sweepers, two water trucks. You got two tandems with each, with each crew sweeping. Uh, how, many lane, how many miles of road we got? 300, uh, yeah, 300 lane miles. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, Thank you. we're not a small town. We're, we're a pretty big town to sweep every road we have twice uh, just because of sand that we don't need, Yeah, honestly. And if you're thinking about harmful algal blooms as well, we, we heard earlier about phosphorus um, from Jonathan and uh, that's a contributor to that too. So it's another material. So what's been fascinating to me over the last couple of years is we've been really focused on salt and chlorides. And then when you, when you start to look not only Lake George Basin wide, but then park wide, there's a tremendous amount of abrasives that are being used that are being mixed with salt. And we're seeing that that's actually the opportunity. So it, so it sounds counterintuitive. If this is a salt reduction initiative, why on earth are we going to straight salt? But I think in, in their case, when we, when, we, when we just came in and did our initial discovery process, it was like, oh, it's really 50-50 mix. And oh, the gates really are open at six inches we can see 30% reduction opportunity right there, right? And, then, and that's exactly what happened. That's but I not, think, that's yeah, That's not changing any of your dials on your, in your sander truck. That's not even doing any math yet. That's not doing any calibration. That's not doing any of the, of the figuring where you can start dropping your salt reduction down. That's just changing from 50-50 to straight salt and dropping your door down. So I think, Lots of discussion, I remember, but that's that's where I get excited because the, you know this whole fifty percent or more reduction. When you look at it from that angle, it's like shooting fish in a barrel, right? So we just we just got to get started somewhere though. So that's where your start was. Yeah. Not everybody has the same opportunity, but again, if you're if you're one of those that are in the sand game right now, um, let's talk, right? Because there, I think there may be some opportunities there for you. All right. Anything else you want to say? I'm not sure. I have to. Mark? <laughs> Mark? Uh, I guess uh, from my point of view as a deputy, uh, we have 30 guys. I'm the only one in the department without a CDL. I've never even plowed a driveway. So we really need someone like Scott who can spearhead things, someone who cheerlead, can cheerlead the whole thing. Because I can say, no, this is how I want you to do it. But all the experienced guys aren't going to listen to the guy who's sitting behind the desk. 
So that's really what you need is just someone who goes, no, this is how we're gonna do it. This way, someone who can believe in the program and make it happen. So, you know, Scott's our cheerleader. He looks great that's in the skirt awesome. and pom poms. <laughs> I, I'd pay for that picture, but yeah. Um, well, I don't wanna be that weird, but anyway. Uh, so you, you said something though that we, we have internally as a team been saying a lot recently is you need the one person, right? It just takes, so just do it, but you need the one person to just do it to be the champion, right? And that's, that's where I believe we, you know, we, we could have, I think next year we could have 20 chairs up here if we wanted to, because we're starting to find more of those people, right? So, so you're out there, right? And I hope a lot of you are in this room. All right, Mike, ready, man? Yep. Okay, and I gotta say, I, um, I was going to put on here uh, passion, actually. I meant to say passion, but I, I have never met a guy more passionate about this out of the gate, man. Like, I've, this is the first time that I've actually had to say, whoa, let's, let's slow down on this actually a little bit. So let's, let's take it away. Okay, we're down up rural. We're up north, Clint County. Um, I've always believed in science. Older guy. Uh, we're using 70,000 yards of sand salt mix a year <clears throat> and spending a month to clean up in the spring and it's there's got to be a better way to to handle this yeah so i started following what was going on in lake george but wasn't quite sure how to do it so i took one of my i had older guys just like he was saying but since then retirement come in so i got a young crew i said now's the time so we jumped in mm -hmm. the truck unannounced went down to see matt and, and tim down the town of Hague, talked to them and when we left i'll be on we were information overload to be honest with you uh, <laughs> because when they start talking you know they've been in the game a long time and uh we come back and we made a second trip down there uh still overwhelmed but understood it better got a hold of phil signed on letter out on that salt reduction we knew there was a better way uh had a meeting with our supervisor, brought it up to town board what I wanted to do. And town board said, go for it. And when you get a board that gives you the okay, you take advantage of it. So we started ordering stuff and getting in it and had another meeting with town of Hague and Phil. And he said, how are you coming? You got that one truck? I said, well, we got the one truck, but we're gonna run all seven runs right out of the gate. We're gonna, we're gonna jump in this full bore uh, we're coming into our first winter. The stuff's coming. Um, but I'm excited about it. And our goal, is, and we've always kind of been a leader in Peru, is in Clinton County. We're going to be the only one to get in it right now. But our goal in, with the board is once we prove how this system is going to work, we're going to, my goal is to draw the rest of the towns in Clinton County into this. And uh, we got a lot of small towns that can't really afford to do this. But if we prove it on, through the trial and error and working with Tim and his crew and uh, Phil here, and I'm very confident it's going to work, we're going to draw the other towns in. There's interest after our every county meeting. They're talking to me. I've already had a couple uh, towns wanting me to come talk to their town boards and stuff like that. So uh, I did have some, even the young guys were a little nervous. Uh, they wanted to have a meeting. So... I, I took it one step further. I had Matt, Tim, Phil come back up. I said, I can answer some questions, <laughs> but do we go through it one or two winners? It's not really gonna resonate in their heads what we're trying to do. So we'll bring Tim and Matt up from Hague and Phil, and then when they left, they, next morning they come in and thank me for, the, you know, for that chance uh, to do this. So uh, I think it's definitely gonna be a success. Um, so all I could say is anybody out there that's thinking about it, just talk to your board. You know, it's, if you got some older guys, it's definitely I can understand it's going to be tougher to get them to, to do it. But it's going to prove itself. There's no doubt in my mind. It's basically all I got to say. Amen, brother. All right. Um, I'm going to move on. We'll, we'll save some questions for you. I'm going to move on to uh, Edinburgh. And I actually want to start with Wayne, who's actually the highway supervisor. Wayne, remind us again, because you just said it. So I think this is an interesting example. What's your budget? My overall budget, snow removal, is 95000 Yeah. 
which, which for those of you who aren't aware, that's like nothing. <laughs> so uh, just saying. So I um, appreciate the <laughs> support on that. So, but they're doing a lot with nothing. So take it away, Donnie, man. So Donnie's actually been the brains behind this. Okay, it was five or so years ago. Wayne says, I can't deal with this messy sand anymore. Can we go to salt? Other people are doing it. Yeah, try it. So what we learned quick was we can do more with less salt because we weren't fighting hard pack, the mess of the road. Uh, the, a lot of the stuff's been mentioned, the sweeping, the fuel costs, the extra man hours out there trying to get the hard pack off. So we learned, well, we saved some money. And then we found out how to calibrate old school ways by measuring shaft RPM on our spreaders and engine RPM and met with Tim and Rob and people and learned uh, about the automated stuff. Now we had to go back, Wayne did all the paperwork and how much money we'd saved already just experimenting and same story, Tom Board, yeah, let's try it. We bought, uh, we fitted all the trucks with the uh, automated spreading systems and uh, road temperature sensing systems so we can know what rate we should shoot for. Since then also, live edge plows have played a huge role. And just this last year, we've uh, getting into de-icing. We were able to purchase a brine machine and some storage tanks and a sprayer. So moving right along fast now. Um, basically, most of it's been done in the past two years. And it's not impossible. There's a lot of people out there saying that you can't afford it, you can't do it. If you go, if you don't, if you go away from 50-50 mix, does that mean 100% salt? You're using more salt? No, that's not true. You can, you can really do it, and we're proving it, like the other towns, with all the help, their help. Awesome, man. I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell us right now. So we're gonna ignore that clock because we got a few more minutes, and everybody else was over. So we're gonna go over for a couple minutes here. One thing I like to do, Tim, can you bring up? Um, so. I actually was not aware that what was going on in Edinburgh until Tim in particular kept poking me, you got to go up there and see what they're doing. And lo and behold, what you, what you shared with me was, I think these guys are, are swim certified. Wayne, you want to come up? Wayne. So I, I met with them. I was actually already in the park on a Friday. I drove down on my way home. I live off of Route 30 in the town of Dwaynesburg. I said, I'm gonna stop in. And, and lo and behold, I, I, had, I got goosebumps. And so I said, I'm coming back on Monday and we're gonna do a full Sorry. audit and let's just verify that what you say is true. So that's, that's part of our process is the verification process. And so I wanna congratulate you guys uh, because You've actually, I think, very quickly become part of this community. And I want to just stress what, what Rob said earlier. Like this, this has really become a community of folks that are bought in and, and understand how to do this, right? And, and what I want to offer this, though, is it's really creating this cu culture of collaboration that, you know, eight years ago, I would have never predicted that this was what was going to happen. But this is exactly what needs to happen for it to be a sustainable initiative it's got to actually sustain itself, you know, rather than us sort of hold hands through it. And so I'm just really appreciative of, of the guys from Hague and the guys from Lake George in particular, because they're the ones that, you know, although they were initially resistant, are the ones that have actually taken this and expanded this community beyond any way that our company could ever do or anybody, any individual organization could do. So with that, I want to congratulate uh, the town of Edinburgh. You have earned the SWIM certification. On our behalf, Wayne, as we built this community, I learned it from Rob. And Rob, please present it on to me. So this is for all these guys. Small team, big heart, big results, man. So congratulations. I will say too, you know, I, I, wanted, I wanted these guys to present it to you because you're really the ones that made it happen. And little joke aside on this too, this is actually the town of Hague's plaque. So we, we didn't actually have enough time to get one made. So you're going to have to give it back to him, but then I'll get you one later. All right. Um, and just one last thing. I, Rob doesn't know I'm about to do this, but if you look behind you, Rob, so I, and I want to give Rob what I would call the innovator award because um, it's interesting. I went through 
years worth of photos and I could not find one darn photo of you where I could actually see your face clear enough. But I thought the one to the left was classic because Rob's been carrying around this scale in this box for I don't know how long going from town to town helping people just learn how to calibrate. And so really you're, you're the one that helped get this started, you and Dan. Um, uh, who's since retired, but uh, I just want to give you a shout out because it, it really boils down to it started with you. So thank you. All righty. You're done. We're out of here. <laughs> Thanks all. Do we have any questions? I know Phil went over. We have one question right here. Yeah. We have time for a couple questions. Mr. Mr. Niemer here. And stick around, guys, because the question may be for you. Well, first of all, uh, congratulations to uh, the people that were up there for everything they've done and the success they've had. It's, um, it's really cool stuff. So thank you uh, oh. for, for all that. But my question is to the county, uh, counties and to the towns, had they been able to order, uh, because of the salt reduction, had they been actually able to order less salt uh, and have less salt on hand in their storage areas? Yeah, let me try to answer that broadly. Um, yes and no. Um, so I think I know why you asked the question maybe, but once you order your salt, um, for the season, let's say, right? So Mike, maybe you can tell me how yours works, right? But a lot of times what happens is then you, you have to actually use or take 70, sometimes it's 70, 75% of it. So there's almost this incentive to have to use it. Um, otherwise you're penalized. And I do think that that's something that needs to change. Um, and, uh, you know, I know it's been discussed in the SALT task force, I know, which I'm a part of. And uh, but that, that's, that's one of the limiting factors, so I'm glad that you brought it up. But there, we have seen, uh, Wayne, you went from what to what? Just yell it. We found, uh, this year only used 368 tons so far. We found 1,200 down to that amount so far. So 1,200 down to, call it 400 round numbers, right? Yeah. Usage. You're not penalized. No, okay, we're so not. that's new. We're that's not new. penalized. We never have, as far as I know, right, George? Yeah. Yeah. See. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Okay. If somebody needs to talk to the state, because that doesn't make any sense, right? Well, it's it's the salt suppliers those who penalize you. It's not the state. We'll, we'll take one more quick question because uh, we want to have time for the. So um, first of all, I want to join Robert in congratulating the teams there for doing some amazing work. Uh, really amazing. Um, but you've educated us in the past that half of the salt goes down from private applicators. Um, yeah. You know, hotels and parking lots and whatnot. Um, and you talked about how you're doing some sharing now of brining equipment. But, but are, we in, are we engaging the private applicators? Do we, do we know how to bring them into the initiative so that you can make progress with them? Good question. First, thanks for listening. To, I must have mentioned that five years ago, so you must have been listening then, so thank you. <laughs> um, yes, we have, we've been trying to engage. It's been tough here, and uh, I'm not exactly sure what it is. It's, it's already a fragmented industry, and I'm talking about my industry, right? So it's, it's already a fragmented industry. It's even that much more fragmented here, uh, just in this market. Um, I will say this too, the, the parking lot scenario, like a lot of this does come from parking lots, 50% or more has been studied, right? Where there's parking lots though. So I think the Adirondack Park in general is, is a little bit unique to that statistic, right? But there are pockets like, you know, we saw earlier Lake Placid. Most of that runoff is coming from private properties, not roads. Right uh, here in, in the south end of the basin. It's, it's no coincidence why it's a hot spot here, because I think you have other application. And I just want to say this, that bucket has got 50 pounds in it. 
How many of you are putting half of that bucket down every time on your driveway? Because we all contribute to this. It's not, it's not just the roads, it's not just the parking lots, it's us too, right? So we are also over applying, I guarantee it, right? And I, I tell everybody here in this room, if you can afford it, just, just go chloride free and be done with it. Um, so it'll just help that right away. Thanks, Phil, and thanks to the municipalities. Um, another round of applause for all their, their hard work. Um, now we'll move on. Um, I'm pleased to welcome our next speaker, Sawyer Kresip, with uh, provide an update on the work of our good partner at ADK Action. Sawyer is the executive director and has a master's degree in environmental management from Yale. And she's also been in Adirondack Wilderness Guide. So we'll turn it over to Sawyer. Hi, everybody. There's such good energy in the room right now. Thank you to all our last presenters. That was fantastic. As Chris mentioned, my name is Sawyer Cressup, and I'm the new director with ADK Action. Some of you may remember Brittany Christensen has been a part of these summits for a long time. She passed the torch to me this spring, and I'm so glad to be involved. This morning, I'm going to share a little bit um, about ADK Action's leadership on road salt reduction over the past decade and tell you a little bit about our most recent initiative working um, on a part of that focus, really trying to be the glue between what we heard in our first session around the science and what we just heard around implementation. How do we fan the flames of all this energy, excitement, and knowledge for what's already there to make progress? And the way we do that is through the Clean Water Safe Road Partnership. First, though, let me tell you a little bit about ADK Action. For those of you who aren't familiar with our organization, we're a nonprofit group that was formed in 2011 by a small group of people who believe that those with passion, time, and commitment can really make a difference on issues that matter. Um, the through line through our work has really been thinking about unmet needs, where are really the gaps in leadership for uh, protecting our environmental resources and promoting vibrant, connected, sustainable communities. Uh, you'll see on the side all of our project icons represented there. So we do a whole lot more than just thinking about safe winter road maintenance. We also do work to connect low-income communities with local healthy food in the Adirondack Park. We help communities uh, compost those food scraps, keep them local to build the soil. We do work protecting pollinator habitat uh, and connect communities with affordable housing and broadband internet. So we're really working across the board, but road salt is the issue that led to our founding. And we've, we've been at this for a long time for a fairly young organization. Up here is a timeline of all our involvement. Um, and it's exciting to hear that there's strong progress being made on this issue. Anyone who's worked on something for a long time will know that's exactly what you wanna hear. And yet the threats and the challenges remain. And of course there are those lags to keep in mind. So we've certainly got more work to do. We started our work really with the Road Salt Conference here today, helping to organize one of the first summits and have been involved as a partner and a sponsor, at times a presenter ever since. We've also worked to help um, create new knowledge and partner with uh, scientists to bring out the best practices and really support science that was leading the way towards implementation. We've helped create the review of effects and costs of de-icing for winter road maintenance. We helped put out the roadmap for uh, reducing road salt, and you can pick up a copy of that on our table outside if you're interested. We helped put out the economic impact study for road salt and AWI's well and aquifer study for, for private wells. We've led and been a part of working groups as well and have worked hard to try to support legislation that's going to make a difference on some of these topics. Uh, we formed the Adirondack Road Salt Working Group eight years ago uh, and the collaborative working group with state agencies four years ago and we've supported the passage of the Randy Preston Road Salt Reduction Act and uh, just this year we've been involved in the task force through through Brittany's engagement. In the early years of that work this is how we approached our attitude towards road salt. 
Maybe some of you have seen these bumper stickers floating around. And what we found over time is that is simply not the way we're going to make progress. Um, a, sometimes we got confused for a liquor distributor, if we're holding the salt. But B, we found that, as is mentioned, it, it's really unrealistic that we'll get to a world where there is no road salt applied. There are ways that we can be safer if we work towards this balance, and that's what the Adirondacks is all about. It's a place to work, live, and play, but it's also a place where complex ecosystems can thrive. And if we're thinking about what it takes to reach success on both sides of that, salt is part of the solution. And as we saw with those buckets, you might be going towards less but straight salt. So we had to think about this with a little more complexity. And to Eric's point, if it's going to work, it's got to be practical to implement. So the way we're thinking about things now is clean water, safe roads, because no one should have to choose between the two. That's the beauty of what we're able to do when we get the right people in the room. We get all the training to those who are out riding the routes, in the shop, making the change. We're working towards what will be a three-phase implementation process, and we've touched on each of these so far this morning. Um, our first is working with municipalities to help empower their work implementing um, safe winter road maintenance strategies that are also going to help get to less salt on the road. We're also now planning for some of our work engaging the driving public, homeowners, and um, particularly commercial applicators as well as we move into phase three. And I'll tell you a little bit more about the progress that we've seen through each of these. So thanks to funding from the Lake Champlain Basin Program, we've been able to start on phase one of the work this year. We've engaged 10 fantastic communities who are willing to be, no pun intended, in the driver's seat, being the leader to try to show that this is possible, starting where there is low-hanging fruit, starting with what makes sense for their team, for their town, and then being the one to prove the model and bring along those who don't have the same conditions, who have skeptics in the room, who need to take their time and, and see what can come of it before they're able to have the conditions right to make change. As part of that, we've been able to bring people into a room together to build that community, create that network. So hopefully there's uh, a group of people who can respond to questions and challenges. I don't envy the operators in the room. You all have a tremendously difficult job. There's no shortage of competing priorities. You are up late at night making tough calls when people like me are sleeping or trying to sleep because I have a new puppy. But um, we're hoping that, that as Phil said, it, it, it's not something that we can do. It's something that we can help support those who are making the work happen to do. Um, and in order to support that, we've had the benefit of working with AWI to create some custom maps that'll help establish a baseline for what are the salt levels in these communities now? What do those levels mean in context with some of the higher end and lower end of the spectrum? And how can you benchmark change over time, five, 10 years later, to show that salt levels are decreasing? How can you get a better sense of where the runoff maps will, will indicate uh, aquifer or well site spread so you have the information you need to make informed decisions. And then finally, thinking about how can we continue to offer professional development opportunities, trainings are gonna be useful and get towards action. This all started though by trying to create the right conditions for change. As Mike mentioned, getting town leadership involved is, is part of the key to success. So what we did is we created a pledge, pledge to reduce road salt, which is a, a non-binding MOU, but with adoption from about 30 communities, it helps set the stage for uh, buy-in across the board for these efforts. Again, those water quality maps will help us measure change over time. And then our peer support through this network. Um, it, it's really all about how can we keep, keep um, moving the ball down the field towards change. And it's not going to be us doing it. We're really just trying to be the glue. If there are other opportunities for training, we want to try to be there to help support it, find the funding, bring the right experts to the table. We've had just the greatest benefit to work with Phil Sexton on this. And, um, there are no shortage of experts in the making in this room today. So please, if you have something that you want other communities to know, uh, let us know. We want to help amplify your message. And one of those things, just thinking about where we can begin today with calibration, doing a calibration workshop together. 
We also see benefit to curating some of the best resources available. There's no shortage of information available online and it's tricky to know what's what and to have a one-stop shop. So our website, adkaction.org, we've got some of that available. There's a special page all for road salt reduction if you're looking to um, find an easy place to direct other colleagues to or to learn more yourself, this is a great place to visit. And then finally, we'll think about what does the driving public need to know as communities change their winter road maintenance strategies? You may want to make a little bit of change, get a proactive head start, and then as it's working, you wanna have the right responses to tell your community when you get those calls in the middle of the night or early morning when people are waiting to leave their driveway and may not see sand on the road, may be looking for the pooled salt at the edges of corners and may not know what those brine strips are. Um, so we wanna hear from everyone. What, what do you want folks to know? We think we know, but we, we're not the ones who are, who are moving this forward, as I mentioned. We're also thinking to the, to the latest question around private applicators. If we can change the sense of knowledge for the driving public, who are also then the ones who hire private applicators, that's where we're gonna see some change. If it's the one who's contracting their work, that's how you're going to get more amenable uh, respect for reduced salt practices and reduced uh, resource practices more widely. So I hope when we come back next year, we can tell you more about how those second and third phase are moving. We may not be as far as we expect because we're really holding on to the progress we're making in phase one, working with municipalities. We're actually slowing down, not because we're losing momentum, but because we're gaining it. We're really seeing the change happen at the town and county level. And for that, I wanna say thank you. And if you wanna be involved, you don't have to be in the Lake Champlain Basin. You don't have to be in the Adirondack Park. We would love to talk with you to figure out how some of these resources and this network can be available to you and so you can be a part of it. But with that, I just want to say thank you again for having me, and please don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you, Sawyer. Thank you, Any questions for Sawyer? Seeing none, um, thank you very much, Sawyer. Was there one? Um, as, as you were speaking, one of the things that came to mind to me is that the highway superintendents are elected officials and they feel the pressure of the public mm -hmm. very, very greatly. And so without a change in public perception of what they're doing, it's going to be hard to get the highway superintendents to buy in like the group of people you have here. Mm -hmm. So it, it seems to me like the cultural shift is not just the people applying it, but the public as well, because we want to make sure we support those elected officials to make this change. Definitely. They need that kind of cover to support the changes. They've got to see it reflected in the voting booth, too. Thank you for that. Yeah, good point. I think that was picked up earlier by, uh, by Tim as well as, you know, respect from the, the public that's using the infrastructure. Great point. Any other questions? Um, if not, um, a couple of housekeeping items before we turn it over to our sponsors for their presentations. Um, in the package, you will see some evaluation sheets. If you could please take a little time and leave them for us, it really helps us try to improve um, this event and make it fit your needs and, and answer your questions better. Right after the next three presenters on from our sponsors, we will have a short break and there will be the demo sessions. Hopefully it's not raining out there. I think we are just gonna beat that that window. Um, so there will be three kind of sessions that will be filmed and virtual. Um, but please go around and speak with all of our sponsors and the people that have the equipment out there. There's also some tables in the lobby. Uh, and I will read one note that came across uh, on the, uh, the chat box. Um, talking about uh, this is really an infrastructure issue. There should be federal and state funds available to help preserve our roads and our bridges and uh, you know, use that to drive um, road salt reduction. So with that, I would like to turn it over to our first sponsor. It would be James from De-Icing Depot to talk about his product and be sure to see James outside. Thank you.
Hi, good morning, everybody. Uh, I am James with De-Icing Depot. And uh, I did want to start after Phil's last uh, conversation that we do not make anybody take what they do not order. Um, that's typically something that happens to municipalities or states. Uh, we do serve states and municipalities, and I would never make, or a lot of our other local vendors in our area, we do not make you take what you do not order. We understand sometimes you need more, sometimes you need less, and we're, uh, we're on the ride with you. Um, pretty excited to talk today. Uh, we offer all sorts of non-chloride de-icers, solar salts, those of you that are making brine. Do I have control of my slides? The green button. The green button. Sorry. Um, uh, those of you that are making brine, I'm sure you understand the difficulties doing that. Um, you're using mostly uh, road salt in this area. And sometimes it can be difficult because it's full of grit and sand and larger granular sizes, so it's hard to make that brine. Um, so if anybody wants to speak to me after the show on solar salts and brine mediums so that it's easier and quicker for you guys to make brine and you won't get all the dirt and other things caught up in your tips uh, while you're spraying. Uh, we offer lots of de-icing uh, equipment, all aircraft grade aluminum. Um, we do stuff from 50 gallons to 5,000 gallons. Uh, last year we made sprayers that could identify bridge pillars and not spray them as it was driving by. Um, so lots of stuff, we do lots with municipalities and contractors and uh, as well as lots of custom work. Uh, most exciting thing that I have, and uh, I've been very, very proud of this, is going all electric. Um, so coming next year, we'll be able to replace every Honda motor or hydraulic motor on your truck with a 12 volt electric pump that can achieve the same rates that you're getting now. Um, they draw about 30 amps. You'll never have to deal with changing oil again in your Hondas or the salt mist coming into uh, the flywheel and clogging everything up. These motors are 100% submersible. Uh, our tester has been sitting in salt brine for almost a year now and has not stopped running. Um, so we'll be able to come in and take care of all those issues uh, while you guys are spraying brine. I know the Hondas are a, a big uh, uh, Achilles heel uh, when you guys are spraying brine. Um, thank you again uh, for having me. If you have any questions, uh, my name is James, uh, and I'll be outside. Thank you, James. We'll, you can direct questions to him outside. Um, next, we have Steve Sapanik with the uh, New York rep from Metal Plus. Is Steve here? Oh, there you are, Steve. Sorry. Come on up. Well, thank you. Thanks. I uh, wasn't expected to speak. Um, really don't have a lot to say other than I've got a plow outside. If you uh, want to go outside and look at it and ask me some questions, we can do that. I know uh, sectional plows were, sectional edges were brought up quite a bit during this. And I know from many years of past experience in the industry, the changes they're making in the improvements and the reduction of salt usage. So all of you should seriously consider and not just metal plus, but going that direction. It will make the world a difference in clean up, salt savings, operation time, fuel savings. Okay? Any questions? We'll go outside and talk about it. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. And sorry uh, you didn't get the memo on that. So <laughs> it's good you're quick on your feet. Um, last, we have Joe. From Innovative Surface Solutions, Joe and, and Innovative have been a big uh, supporter over the years, and we'll turn it over to Joe quickly. After this quick late break, which will mold together with the demo session, so be sure to go outside. Thank you. Perfect. I appreciate that oh, as I drop everything up here. Um, yeah, we really believe in what the Lake George Association is doing with salt reduction, so that's why we continue to be one of the leading edge sponsors here. Uh, for those of you who don't know about Innovative Surface Solutions, uh, we're the largest liquid de-icing manufacturer and distributor in the Northeast US. We've got a 40 million gallon capacity terminal down in Glenmont, New York. 
where we distribute all sorts of different liquids to municipalities, private contractors. Um, to the person who asked the question before, I think it was a gentleman over here about contractors getting on board with reducing their chloride usage. Uh, I had a presentation the other day in front of 125 contractors in the state of Connecticut put on by the Connecticut Groundskeepers Association with the sole goal of promoting technologies, promoting salt reduction. So people are out there listening. Contractors see it more than anybody when it comes to their, their bank accounts, their bottom line. So if they can cut down their usage, it goes a long way for contractors. So they are trying to get on board in the cutting edge industry of using liquids, using this technologies that are available to them to try to reduce the amount of material they need to use. Um, so my point of contention with Chris was I do presentations all over and I could probably talk for an hour and I have a very scientific presentation that I'd like to show you a couple slides in. I'm gonna try to keep it short but sweet, but I will tell you that this is available in a longer format if anybody thinks that the information is interesting to them and would like to request that. We've got regional managers, territory managers all over the Northeast US who are more than willing to come right to your location and do this presentation for you. So keep that in mind with us. Um, there isn't one solution. We've seen from all these presentations that have been done so far that to reduce your salt usage, it's gonna be a combination of things. It's gonna be cutting edge technology when it comes to the equipment. It's gonna be um, you know, using monitors and sensors that are gonna help you out. It's gonna be calibration and really getting buy-in from the guys who are working on the crews. I can't speak to all that stuff, but what I can speak about is the liquids because that's what Innovative Surface Solutions has been doing for over 35 years. That's what I've been doing for almost 13 years now, where everybody else in here has to worry about other things. They have to worry about box culverts and sand and cleaning it up and all street sweepers and everything like that. For 12 months out of the year, I focus on de-icing materials. So I've been able to kind of go a little deeper into that rabbit hole than maybe a lot of people have before. Um, one other note I'd like to make before I go to this next slide is that if you're not tracking winter severity, you need to start tracking it because winter severity matters. We saw some of the slides earlier where you see some spikes. Yeah, the one question was asked, I think, by the gentleman right over here. Why was there a really, really big gap in, in the chlorides in 2014? Well, I only remember this because that was the year my first daughter was born. So I remember being on my back deck on Christmas Day and I was grilling steaks. It was 75 degrees and sunny out. So there wasn't really a whole lot of need for any salt on the ground during that particular day. So um, that year was pretty mild, but winter severity can really help you track that and see where the correlations are, where your reductions are coming. If you have an extremely heavy winter and you're still reducing the amount of salt you're using, then you're doing a bang up job. But if the weather is 75 and sunny and your numbers are going down, there's a correlation there. So just keep that in mind. I just wanna make sure everybody is aware of that. Um, hopefully this works. Perfect. So this is a chart that we have taken from the National Cooperative Highway Research Program guidelines for the selection of snow and ice control materials to mitigate environmental impact. This is third party information, but we like to promote this because this was not put on by Innovative. This is not something that we paid a university to do a research project on. This was completely independent and it tells an interesting story. So with this, you'll see we cover some of your common de-icing materials, your salt brine, magnesium chloride, calcium chloride, um, even some of the lower, uh, lower blend magnesium chlorides. And then we also cover some of the OBPEs as we call them, the organic based performance enhanced liquids or agriculturals, you'll hear them called a lot. But what this does is this is gonna take the material and it's gonna talk about how many pounds of active ingredient are actually in that material. And then based on that, the chloride ion percentage of the material. So for example, salt brine is 60.66% chloride. Um, yeah, chloride, that's how much of it is. So it's 2.25 pounds of active ingredient, which is actually for 23.3, it's 2.8. But um, so your actual, every gallon of salt brine you put out is 1.37 pounds of chloride that you put down. So they went and they took this and they looked at the gallons of de-icer that you need to melt 100 pounds of snow and ice. And when they did this at certain temperatures, they just tracked how much it needed. So they started at 23 degrees, and at 23 degrees, 
to melt 100 pounds of snow and ice, you needed 5.4 gallons of salt brine at 23%. That equated to 7.4 pounds of chloride ions that you were going to be introducing because of being able to melt that. Now, as you start to work your way down, you start to look at materials like calcium chloride, magnesium chloride, which have much higher amounts of pounds of active ingredient per gallon, and they even have more uh, chloride ion contribution. However, you need to use a lot less of them. So when you're able to use less of them, so for example, mag chloride at a 30% concentration, at that same 23 degrees, you needed 2.8 gallons of it to melt that same 100 pounds of snow and ice. So your total chloride ion contribution, even though there's more chloride per gallon of it, is still gonna be less at that 23 degrees. So you can follow all the way down this chart. And again, I don't have the full time to go through every product and really break this down for everybody, but I am always available to do this presentation for anybody. But if you go down to some of these, these different temperatures, you can see, um, and it's all things that guys in this room know already. Salt, once you get below like 20 degrees, it struggles. We all know that. So you can see here on empirical data that you need more of that material to melt that snow and ice. And that's why you've always had to put out more when you're using just straight salt. So what I really want you to focus on here are some of the premium liquids, something like the agricultural liquids, like the um, magnesium chloride and corn syrup or the magnesium chloride and molasses. So you can look at those materials and you can see that obviously with something like the molasses, you only need 2.1 pounds of that material to melt that same 100 pounds of snow and ice at 23 degrees. So your chloride contribution is gonna be half of what you used with that regular salt brine. Salt brine is a great tool. It is a great anti-icing tool. We can make it better with premium liquids. If you're thinking about putting salt brine on your onboard wetting systems, I would not recommend that. And this is empirical evidence why, because adding more salt to it is not gonna help us reduce salt. We need to start thinking about the premium liquids that we're putting down, because premium liquids matter. We're using premium equipment, we're using the highest quality plow systems with the segmented plows now, which are amazing. You go into a cockpit of a truck now, it's like being a pilot. You've got joysticks galore, you've got computer systems. It's incredible. We need to start taking that approach. You know, we're using all this high quality equipment. Why not use the highest quality liquids? So again, I can do this presentation for anybody. Contact me, contact anybody in our company. We can schedule a full presentation in front of you, your town board, whoever is most interested in that. Hell, we'll even buy some pizzas for you and bring them in if we need to, okay? But thank you, everybody. I'm gonna be out by my truck out there. If anybody has any questions, please feel free to come on out. Thank you, Joe, I appreciate it. Uh, we've made it through session two. Uh, we're at a break in demo time. So please go out, check out the demos. Lunch is a bag lunch between 12 and 12.30. So you'll pick that up and can eat it here or wherever around the uh, resort. And 12.30 will be our keynote speaker, Mark Yagi from Waterkeeper Alliance. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is James with Deicing Depot, and uh, I'm going to present to you an all-electric uh, roadway deicing sprayer. Uh, this particular model here, you can spray 45 gallons to the acre at 15, 16 miles per hour, all three lanes, and around 9, 10 miles per hour uh, on a post street, also all three lanes. Um, these units are 100% wireless. You can control them from the cab, from your phone, or a key fob, and they also have a serviceable port where you can plug in a controller in case if you lose your phone or you lose the wireless device. Um, these are all aircraft grade aluminum. Um, all the parts are made out of poly and stainless steel. Um, the unit will run around 40 amps continuous um, and these particular pumps are 100% submersible. Uh, they're from the marine industry. They are meant to be in salt water all the time and they love to run all the time. So I always tell people don't turn it on and off. Let it run all day long. That's where it likes to be. Um, I'm going to control it here from my phone. The motor will start up, and then uh, I'll, sh I'll turn on these three-lane booms so you guys can see how it sprays.
So from, from here all the way out to the end, I get about 28 feet worth of coverage. Um, pump's running full bore, so it's not like a Honda. You can clearly hear me, and I don't think you can hear the pump at all. And I can shut it on and off from my, my phone using Bluetooth, or like I said, from uh, this here device that goes into the cab of your truck. Um, the device can be loaded in from here, so you don't have to get up on top and get into the uh, tank to load it so you guys are not climbing on trucks. And then with a simple switch of a ball valve, it can load itself. Or at the end of the day, if it's still full of brine and you want to get the brine out of the unit, I can switch the ball valve the other way and I can pump the fluid back into my storage tanks. Uh, the unit also comes with a hose reel, so I know a lot of municipalities probably aren't spraying sidewalks. Um, but for those of you who are doing roadways, uh, I mean sidewalks, uh, you got 50 feet here, so you can go and spray a sidewalk with the same pump. And this will retract itself. And that is our electric sprayer. If you have any questions, you can call me at 863-232-8183 uh, or my email, james at deicing.com. Hi, my name is Joe Cashin. I'm with Innovative Surface Solutions. Innovative is the largest uh, distributor of liquid deicers in the Northeast United States. We have a 40 million gallon capacity terminal in Glenmont, New York, where we will ship product all the way from Maine to Ohio to North Carolina and everywhere in between. We've got a large variety of liquids that we do offer. This is our flagship material called our Magic Minus Zero. It is a feed grade molasses and magnesium blend. It's a very versatile liquid that you can use for de-icing, anti-icing, for treating salt, for salt brine enhancing. Uh, it will work at very low temperatures and it's got plenty of sugar in it, which will help resist the refreeze on the road. Uh, the best thing about about 90% of our products that we have on the table here and that we have in our arsenal of products is that they are on OGS contract, which makes purchasing a breeze in the state of New York. Uh, but we also cover all the other states as well and we have, are on state contract for most of those as well. So. We love supporting the SALT Summit here because the overall goal of SALT reduction is something that we do believe in. We want to make sure we use the resources that we have to the best of their ability. There's a tool for every job. We think that using a premium tool with a premium liquid is going to be your best bet for your overall chloride reduction. So I just want to thank the, the Lake George Association and I want to thank everybody for tuning in to this meeting and to this, uh, this presentation that we're doing. And make sure you reach out to your local suppliers. Make sure you reach out to some of the experts in the industry if you are looking to put together a program because we've had wealth of knowledge. This company has been doing it for 35 years. I've been doing this for almost 13 years myself. So I've seen this across a lot of different environments and I've seen this across a lot of different towns and cities. We can help out and we can help you with your overall goal of reducing your salt. So thank you very much. Hi, I'm Steve Sapaniak with Metal Plus. I'm here at Lake George Salt Symposium presenting our snowplow, our segmented live edge snowplow, highway division. This plow is one of the most versatile, state-of-the-art plows in the market today with segmented cutting edges that float, follow contour of asphalt, also trip back in two-foot increments. The plow is carbide. The cutting edges last for an extremely long period of time, but also, most importantly, the way the plow follows contour of asphalt is incredible. It scrapes cleaner than any blade on the market. It is the most salt-saving, fuel-saving, operation time-saving plow available. So, you got any questions? www.metalplus.com. I'm Steve Sapaniak. I'm the New York rep. Give me a call. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope that you enjoyed your lunch and uh, we thank you for sticking around. Hopefully you got out there to see the demos and the great stuff that uh, our sponsors had that would help us all reduce our road salt applications. Um, I am very excited right now to introduce our keynote speaker. Um, environmental advocacy is not a job. It is a passion. It's where you can overcome your fears of feeling uneasy, where you speak for what is right and what is true, where you speak for what 
you want to do and that you are willing to take a stand despite the potential ramifications. I have been very fortunate to have been associated with a special group of people and individuals for the past 20 years who represent and live these values every day to fight and speak for their waters and for their people that rely on them for drinking supplies, for food, and for a quality of life. We are called water keepers, bay keepers, and river keepers. I respect all of them, for they are true heroes and warriors. We are fortunate to have the leader of the Waterkeeper Alliance with us today. Now, despite he's got a couple initials, a JD and LLM, I don't know what they really stand for. I got a PE, I kind of know what that stands for, but you know, these, you know, we, we could be working elsewhere and, and probably being more successful, but again, we are advocates and we are passionate. I first heard about Mark in 2002 when I became the Lake George Waterkeeper, ironically through reading an article that he had authored on the impacts of road salt in the Catskill watershed, the New York City water supply. At the time, Mark was a senior environmental attorney with Hudson River Keeper. Mark was raised on a creek in central Pennsylvania and now leads Waterkeeper Alliance as its executive director and CEO for the past 16 years. So water is, is a part of his life and it's a part of his soul, like all water keepers. I am honored he was available to come and today he will speak to us about the need to act to help the Clean Water Act, which turns 50 years old next Tuesday. Lake George has been fortunate to have received legislation to protect its exceptional waters, but too many of our waters in the US and worldwide remain unprotected despite, despite important laws like the Clean Water Act, which we see getting eroded. Pun intended. Mark shares his passion for clean waters worldwide as there are now over 300 water keepers in 45 countries. I'm excited to share some of the great work here at Lake George with him as a model for freshwater protection and to meet that water keeper standard. It's even more special that we fulfill the long promise we made sometime in the past to make a Lake George visit happen. Perhaps while sharing a beverage at a waterkeeper conference and talking about another passion we share, live music. So please help me welcome a true advocate, a person who walks the walk and talks the talk, a waterkeeper and my good friend, Mark Yagi. <laughs> Thank you, Chris, for that kind introduction. My, um, my 11 year old daughter told me the other day that PE stands for phys ed. <laughs> so. <laughs> um, I'm really, uh, good afternoon everybody. I'm really grateful to be here in, uh, oh let me see. Oh wait, can you go back? <clears throat> um, really grateful to be here in Lake George and happy to be here with all of you. You know, as Chris mentioned, we've got water keepers all around the world, and so I'm really fortunate to get to travel all around the world to visit these water keepers and have some amazing experiences in some beautiful places. But <clears throat> New York is home, and it's always, for me, really the most special experience to get to be places around New York, especially places like the Adirondacks or Lake George, the queen of the American lakes. And so I'm just, uh, I feel like we're really fortunate to have such incredible natural resources right outside our back door. And I'm honored to be here today for uh, Lake George Association Salt Summit and really grateful to my friend Chris Nowitzki for inviting me. Uh, as Chris mentioned, I've known him for approximately 20 years, which is coincidentally as long as the Lake George Waterkeeper has been um, an integral part of my organization, Waterkeeper Alliance. And over the course of its 20 years of, uh, you know, its illustrious 20 years of existence, Lake George Waterkeeper has been out there every day um, working to ensure that the community has a voice in decisions that impact the community and its waterway. And I really 
you know, I admire Chris because he is this dynamic combination of engineer, uh, water quality scientist, and advocate. And that's a potent combination that served him well on issues like septic systems and um, road salt reduction as of today, and uh, development projects. And it's really unique to bring those three skill sets together. I can say I've been working in the water and climate space for more than 20 years, and, and um, I think maybe I'll try to bring one of them to the table. Um, that's what I'm an advocate, which will probably give you an idea of what I'm gonna speak about today. I said to Chris a couple days ago, maybe we should just call it a palate cleanser because um, despite the fact that I wrote an article about road salt 20 some years ago, um, that was like three generations ago to me. And I'm really gonna be talking about kind of the water crisis, water issues, and, um, and not about salt. So you go to the salt in the morning, salt in the afternoon, we'll cleanse the palate with just some water right now. And you know, the main, I guess the main thing I'm gonna be really talking about is is why? Because you've what you've assembled. So you all have assembled the best and brightest of you know people on road salt science and policy and um, re reduction issues and matters and had all these. Uh, I heard about the great panel earlier with all of the road warriors that are out there making change. And um, so you've assembled all these experts and these best and brightest folks here. So what I'm going to do is just talk about. <clears throat> um, I'm going to dial it back to something simple which is why, sort of, why are you doing the work that you do? Or, you know, another way to look at it is, why is it so important that you do the work that you're doing? And <clears throat> I'm gonna kick things off with a, like a, a global to local chat about um, our most important natural resource, which is, of course, water. So if you think about it for just a moment, every part of our lives is affected by water. Like I said, I'll keep it simple, right? We drink it or we die. We grow our crops with it. We fish in our lakes, our rivers, our creeks, our seas. Uh, we bathe with it, we wash with it. We wouldn't have clothes without water. And we also know that people love being on in and around water, like Lake George. And why is that? That's because it, studies show that it makes us happier, it makes us healthier, it reduces stress, and it brings us peace. Many of us have powerful memories of water. Maybe it's a special beach vacation. Maybe it's learning how to swim. Maybe it's learning how to go fishing or with your mother or father. Uh, seeing a whale breach. Lots of different experiences people have with water that make them more connected to a local waterway or, or any other waterway. Think about yours. Chris mentioned I grew up in, um, on a creek in Pennsylvania. So uh, for me, my love of water began growing up in the Susquehanna River watershed in Pennsylvania. And I could walk out my back door and, and, and go for miles. And as a boy, I had a, a golden retriever named Ben. And Ben and I used to swim and fish every day from roughly April to October. We'd go after school, we'd go on weekends, we'd go day after sunny day. Really being on in and around that water was freedom and happiness. And I assumed that these types of experiences are being shared by everyone. But when I got older, learned a little bit more, traveled some, I realized that not everyone could go down to their local waterway, jump in and have a swim without fear of getting sick. And not everyone could draw a cool glass of water, drink it without fear that they were going to be ingesting toxins. And not everyone could go down to their local lake, their river, their creek, or their pond, throw a line in, catch a fish, and bring it home to feed their family like I could without being worried that they were going to poison their family with mercury or PCBs. And, you know, I, I couldn't understand how such an important resource wasn't available to everyone or how other kids weren't able to experience something that was so second nature to me. And... The situation really is more than just a matter of fairness because it's really uh, ultimately killing people. You know, as it shows up there, today more than 2 billion people lack worldwide access to drinkable water. And water scarcity is affecting half the world's population. But at the same time, we're polluting what little water we have left because every day 2 million tons of sewage, industrial, and agricultural waste are being dumped into our planet's waterways. In Pre-COVID times, if we remember back then, 
um, more than half the world's hospital beds were filled with somebody with a waterborne illness. And each year, more people die from unsafe water than from all forms of violence, including war. And consider this. Every year, 3.2 million children under the age of five die from unsafe drinking water and poor sanitation. That's right, 3.2 million children. And, you know, hovering over all of this is the existential uh, crisis of climate change. And climate change is a water issue because climate change is altering the chemistry of our oceans, the character of our coastlines, timing and intensity of rain and snow wreaking havoc around the planet. When I talk to people all over the world when I'm traveling <clears throat> and I ask them what they think about climate change, it always manifests through water. Their responses are always the same. They talk about drought. They talk about flooding. They talk about sea level rise. They talk about ocean acidification, extreme storms, and other issues like that. We see in, in our work, we also see the impacts of climate change through water, and we see it through the lens and the eyes of our water keepers. Uh, <clears throat> in Ladakh, India, our Himalayan glacier water keepers will tell you that in the past 10 years, everything's turned, up to, turned upside down. It doesn't snow when it should, and it rains when it shouldn't. They've had to relocate certain communities because of drought, and they've had to rebuild other communities because of excessive flooding. In um, Mongolia, our Tool River water keeper tells us about how increasing levels of drought have had forced people to move out of the countryside into cities that aren't equipped to handle the surge in population. Or here in the United States, our Seattle, in Seattle, our Puget Sound keeper worries about ocean acidification threatening a $270 million a year shellfish industry. And our water keepers in the Bahamas know that there's a good chance they might lose a majority of their land over the next century. And they worry about the security of their culture, their heritage, and their very existence. So we see how that plays out through water. And even so, with all these threats, we still take water for granted. Because we always sort of have this unconscious expectation that we're going to turn on the, water, the tap and it's going to be there when we need it. But at the same time, our species is squandering this vital, critical resource at a very rapid pace. Which makes you wonder sort of like, how can we be so cavalier about the way water is misused and ill-distributed and violated? You know, my youthful fondness of water from going back to Pennsylvania prompted me to ask, like, you know, what can I do? And ultimately, that's what led me to Waterkeeper Alliance, where I got to meet and, and work with great people like, like Chris. And, you know, our organization was incorporated in 1999, but we trace our roots back to 1966, uh, right here in New York on the Hudson River where a band of blue-collar recreational and commercial fishermen banded together to take the river back from the polluters and restore it to its rightful owners, which were the people of the Hudson Valley. And these uh, fishermen, first as Hudson River Fishermen Association and then as Hudson River Keeper, they patrolled the river, they identified pollution problems, and they used citizen action, science, and law to force those polluters to clean up the mess that they had created. And thanks to them, these fishermen and the laws that they helped put on the books, when I'm traveling around the world, people always remark about how the Hudson River inspired them, that they see it as an icon of ecosystem revitalization because they took a dead river and restored it back to health. There's still a lot of issues and challenges on the Hudson, but today it's cleaner than it's been in more than 50 years. And today, because of their success, those fishermen's success on the Hudson, that sprouted my organization, Waterkeeper Alliance, which is now a global organization uniting more than 330 of these waterkeeper organizations in 48 countries on six continents. And we implore, they, all these groups combined implore more than 1,200 advocates, all modeled after that work that was created on the Hudson. In fact, we have more... Um, and there's Fred Tutman. I was just speaking to somebody about that. That's right. Um, in fact, we have more advocates on the water than any organization in the world. There are water keepers in uh, China, India, Ireland, Bhutan, Bangladesh, Togo, Kenya, Senegal, Peru, Chile, Colombia, and beyond. I won't name all 48 countries. It would be a good quiz, though. 
Um, and that, of course, includes your Lake George waterkeeper, who is out protecting that waterway, your treasured waterway, day in and day out now and for future generations. And these are all women and men who are drawn from different languages, different cultures, different religions, and different legal and political frameworks. But they are fighting for a world where everyone can drink from their local water source without fear of ingesting toxins, where everyone can catch and cook a fish without fear of poisoning themselves, and where our children are nurtured by water and not sickened by it. So to accomplish these goals here in the United States, we have important legal tools that we can use, and particularly the Clean Water Act. So back in the 1960s, our waterways were dying. Uh, <clears throat> in fact, like on the screen, some of our rivers, like the Cuyahoga River in Ohio, were on fire, literally. And, but then in, in 1970, in April of 1970, 20 million Americans took to the streets to demand clean air and clean water. This was the first Earth Day, April of 1970. And that show of force from the American public prompted Congress to act. And so over the next several years, Congress passed what are today considered to be our modern federal environmental laws. The Clean Air Act, the Endangered Species Act, the National Environmental Policy Act, and so on. There's about 28 of them. And in, as part of that, in 1972, Congress overrode President Vixen, uh, Nixon's veto and passed the Clean Water Act, which was a federal law that was designed to reduce or eliminate pollution into our nation's waterways. The Clean Water Act has been very effective at, con at controlling and cleaning up pollution in many respects. In uh, 1920s Portland, Oregon, construction workers refused to work on projects next to the Willamette River because it smelled so bad. Today, the Willamette River is one of the most heavily recreated waterways in the United States. And as noted before, in the 1960s, the Hudson River was nearly dead. Today, it's an icon of ecosystem revitalization. This is some of the success of the Clean Water Act. And we use, in, in communities across the United States, our water keepers are using the Clean Water Act to accomplish their goals of protecting their community's right to clean water. So in, in, for example, in um, <clears throat> Atlanta, Georgia, in the 1990s, our Chattahoochee River Keeper uh, used the, had a settlement with the city of Atlanta under the Clean Water Act that forced the city to upgrade and stop thousands of spills of sewage and, and stormwater into the Chattahoochee River because they had for decades neglected their infrastructure. The settlement ultimately ended up with the city spending $2 billion in investment into their infrastructure. And shortly after that investment was made, E. coli levels plunged by more than 80% in the Chattahoochee River. And the Chattahoochee is now a, a diamond or a uh, something to be proud of in the city of Atlanta, unlike when it was in the 80s. In uh, last year in South Carolina, our Charleston waterkeeper uh, did an investigation and they found that plastic nurdles, or these little plastic pellets that you use to make plastic products, were pervasive throughout the Charleston Harbor, along the beaches. They used the Clean Water Act against a, a package resin, com a resin packaging company and had a historic settlement with them which allowed for, which required contain, new containment measures which would prevent or eliminate future spills and also landed a million dollar settlement, that, uh, settlement fund that would help protect the health and, and water quality in Charleston Harbor. And then out in California, San Diego Coast Keeper used the uh, <clears throat> Clean Water Act against the city of San Diego to secure a massive wastewater recycling uh, program where instead of discharging polluted wastewater into the ocean, now the city is going to be recycling it back into their water supply system. It's going to be providing up to 50% of the city's water supply from recycling that wastewater. And you're talking about 83 million gallons a day in a place where water security is a significant issue out west. <clears throat> and of course, here in New York, the water keepers added Victor use it with the Clean Water Act because the... Um, it was a challenge to New York State's industrial stormwater permit, and the judge ruled that Class A special waters, like Lake George and Lake Placid, were categorically off limits to industrial polluters. So DEC was no longer able to issue a general permit to polluters on those lakes. There are lots of Clean Water Act successes like that, and 
But there, the thing is, there remains so much more work to be done. Uh, we haven't yet fulfilled the promises of the Clean Water Act. In fact, many of our waterways are still far too polluted. In some cases, the pollution is increasing. EPA's own data shows that more than a half a million miles of rivers and streams in the United States are impaired for pollution. Their data shows that about 14 uh, million acres of lakes and reservoirs in the United States are impaired for pollution, and about 40,000 square miles of open waters of the Great Lakes are impaired for pollution. Those numbers should be zero. So the Clean Water Act clearly needs to be strengthened. The act is turning 50 years old next week, uh, a mere five days away, and it's having a midlife crisis. It's gonna be 50, it needs to be updated to deal with current challenges and future challenges. So what we're using that anniversary to do is to celebrate those successes like some of those that I mentioned, but also rally people around the need to strengthen the Clean Water Act. And so in doing that, we've got four key priorities. One is ensuring that there is a strong science-based definition of what is called waters of the United States that are protected from pollution under the Clean Water Act. So if a lake, a river, a creek, a stream, a wetland is not considered to be under the definition of waters of the United States, then pollution can be dumped into that waterway without any protection, without any treatment controls, contaminating drinking water sources, killing fish, and sickening children when they go swimming like that used to happen before the Night Clean Water Act in 1972. By way of example, uh, the, last ex the last administration redefined, the wa redefined waters in the United States, and under that definition, approximately 93% of the waterways in the state of Arizona were no longer protected by the Clean Water Act. And the state of Arizona, by its own admission, did not have the framework or the capacity to bridge that gap. Number two is holding industrial agriculture accountable for their pollution. So the factory farms have replaced independent farmers in many places and result in massive amounts of air, land, and water pollution. And it often disproportionately impacts economically disadvantaged communities. And despite the fact that these factory farms create as much waste as a small city, they're rarely, if ever, required to put in pollution controls or to clean up the mess that they make. In fact, the largest factory farms in the United States are supposed to have Clean Water Act permits. Today, only 31% of them do. The third priority is addressing non-point source pollution, stormwater runoff, and combined sewer overflows. As I'm sure most of you know, we're here talking about road salt today. We're talking about a lot of, uh, of stormwater runoff. So you all know a lot about that. It comes from myriad, myriad um, sources. And it's still one of the largest yet to be fully addressed pieces of the Clean Water Act. It's a lot about what you're talking today. And of course, you know, road salt falls into this category and the work you're all doing is really inspiring and amazing. You know, with municipalities around here achieving 50% reductions, I think Chris told me before this, getting closer to 70% reduction, saving tens of thousands of dollars of taxpayers' money. And that's a prime example of what can be achieved when parties come together and work together on science-based solutions. That's not happening else in, in, a, in a lot of other places. So we really wanna take the great work you all are doing here and be able to replicate that in other locations. In many places, the waterways are still being choked with road salt and other types of runoff with litter and grease and oil and more. And really to correct a lot of the failures that we have in not implementing this provision of the Clean Water Act is we've really also got to make sure that we prioritize this new infrastructure funding to assist communities in controlling water pollution from non-point sources and making sure there's good promotion of green infrastructure as well. The fourth priority is, it involves things that you can't see. So, you know, due to the work of so many uh, different stakeholders and advocates. A lot of the waterways you don't see, they're not on fire anymore. In many places you don't see as much trash. People have worked really hard to get their way. A lot of them are cleaner than they were. Uh, but what we need to be concerned about is <clears throat> things that you can't see. These invisible pollutants that are getting into our waterways that you're not able to see like trash or fire or other ones. Um, 
these are things that are, that are getting into our drinking water. They're getting into the waterways that you, we use for recreation. Some of these are called emerging contaminants. That's because they're not regularly monitored and they're not regulated. And one example I'm going to just talk about briefly is um, are called PFAS or PF, PFAS, which is per and polyfluoral alkyl substances. Uh, some of you may know or be familiar with them, but if not, these are a class of 9,000, more than 9,000 toxic chemicals that were created by accident in the 1930s by chemists at DuPont 3M. They were doing a chemical reaction, and at the end of it, uh, there remained a thin film in the, chem in the chamber that they hadn't expected, and it uh, fought off every attempt they had to try to break the atoms apart. It turned out that this... Um, discovery they had turned out to be quite useful because they found out that it repels water, it repels oil, and it repels grease. So today, we've got PFAS that we're using in many forms. It's in our nonstick cookware. It's in microwave popcorn bags. It's in pizza boxes, burger wrappers, carpets, uh, waterproof, water-resistant jackets, in some cases, dental floss and shampoo as well. And these PFAS are water soluble, so they're in our water now, they're in our fish, and for probably all of us in this room, they're in our blood. The problem is that science is increasingly, link increasingly linking these chemicals to in, um, different types of cancer, liver and kidney problems, immunological problems, and reproductive and developmental harm. So this summer, um, we conducted a first-of-its-kind nationwide sampling survey of surface waters for PFAS. Um, working across the United States, we took 228 samples at 114 sites, so an upstream sample and a downstream sample. We got the lab results a few weeks ago and have compiled them into a report that we're going to release next Tuesday on the anniversary of the Clean Water Act. So um, I can't give away too much at this point, but I can say that we... Uh, in 83% of the samples we took around the country, from Alaska down to Miami, 83% um, of the samples detected PFAS, typically more than one type. We, we tested for 50, 55 different types of PFAS. We found 35 of them, and typically more than one in each one of those samples. And to give you a little bit of the idea of the magnitude, in a waterway in Pennsylvania, my home state, in fact, in my home watershed, not quite close to where I grew up, but in my home watershed, there was a sample of PFOA, which is a very common type of those 9,000 PFAS. It's what we use in nonstick cookware. Uh, the level that was found was 211,000, more than 211,000 times EPA's health advisory limit, the lifetime health advisory limit that EPA has, which is 0 0.004 parts per trillion. If anybody who works in water science, water science and sampling, you probably don't deal with parts per trillion very often. I mean, it may be parts per million, parts per billion, but parts per trillion is um, next to zero. I mean, 0 0.004 parts per trillion is four quadrillion. Uh, so it was found to be 200, more than 211,000 times what EPA says is an acceptable level, healthy level for you to have over a lifetime of drinking water. So EPA is in the process right now of developing national drinking water standards for PFAS. They're going to be releasing a draft this fall with a plan to finalize them by next fall. So utilities are going to have to be preparing for these regulations, going to have to be sampling the waterways, looking at fate and transport, um, preparing to deploy techn technological solutions, among other things. The irony, though, is that Ratepayers will be paying utilities to get PFAS out of our drinking water, which is good. We don't want it in our drinking water. But the, the irony or the unfairness is that there are no federal limits, no limits on how much can be discharged by the industries that are using PFAS. So they're dumping it into our drinking water, and then we're paying to get it taken out. So we're subsidizing that pollution is what's going to happen. And it's a massive issue because there are an estimated 42,000 industrial dischargers of PFAS in the United States, including a dozen or so just down the road in Glens Falls. <laughs> However, the lack of effluent limits on um, industry may change, as there is federal legislation right now that would require EPA to develop water quality criteria and effluent limits on PFAS dischargers like metal, metal finishing companies, electroplaters, paint formulators, textile mills, leather tanners, and so on. So the Clean Water Act led to a lot of great success stories, but the job isn't done. 
we have a lot of work to do to make all of our waterways safe and clean, and it takes all of us to be part of the solution. At the end of the day, you know, apathy and non-involvement are really the, the biggest barriers to meaningful progress and positive change. And so if you, you know, if you care about the future, being a bystander is not an option. <coughs> and we all have our reasons why, why to be part of the solution. Um, you know, I always like to encourage people to think about why. Why do, are they, why do they want to be part of the solution? Why, are they, why do they want to get engaged? Why is clean water important to you? You know, think about what it means to you. I haven't been up to this community in, in a bunch of years, but I still can recall, and I saw it as I was coming in, just the incredible beauty of the communities, the waterway, the natural resources you have here. It's a place that it, it, it nurtures your soul. It gives you a measure of peace. It, makes you, it brings you happiness. And a place that I know you won't stand by and watch be destroyed. So... You know, there's something out there that compels you to do the work that you do. And to get to the heart of these matters, sometimes it just requires you to look inward and think about it from a personal perspective. I know I do. I've got an 11-year-old son and a 14-year-old, or sorry, a 14-year-old son and an 11-year-old daughter. And they both mean the world to me. And I don't want to look back in 20 years and wonder if I could have done more to give them a healthy and sustainable future, because I want to see them have a future that involves clean air and clean water and clean energy and good jobs and equality and a, and a strong economy. I don't want them to look back at their parents' generation with bewilderments and contempt and ask, how could we have left them a world where we've got dirty rivers and dying, and dying oceans and denuded forests and sterile fields? You know, we owe it to these future generations to leave them a better world than what we inherited. Not a world where people don't have enough water to drink or where it's not safe to drink the water because it poisons them. And, you know, the road to fulfilling the Clean Water Act's promise to make sure we do have clean water is a long road. Uh, we've got many more miles to go. And I say, you know, 1968 in Washington, D.C., Martin Luther King Jr. said that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And... Former President Obama used that quote in a commencement address at Rutgers University a few years back. And he said he agreed with that quote, but he didn't feel like the arc of the moral universe bends on its own, bends towards justice or freedom or equality on its own, but rather it depends on us and the choices we make at certain inflection points in history. And that we all need to be change agents that are going to help bend that arc towards creating a world where clean water is a, you know, a reality and a given for all. And I know that, you know, you all have come together here as change agents in the work that you're doing in this road salt reduction program, other projects you're doing to protect Lake George and other communities that you're from, and to preserve these critical community assets. And it requires change makers like you and remembering why you do it and inspiring yourself to keep moving forward. And so I'm just really grateful to be able to be here today and learn more about everything that you're achieving and, and the challenges that you have and how you're overcoming them. And I'm uh, really grateful to be here, Chris. And thank you all so much for having me today. Uh, thank you, Mark. Are there any questions? And I, I completely agree. You know, Mark was afraid that what he was saying couldn't relate to, you know, the road salt and how could he? But clearly what he touched on, you know, changing and, and how we change our mindset and how we approach problems, how we use science, which we're using here, um, and how we really look and change and protect this for our children in the future. So Clearly, it's relevant, and I want to thank Mark for that. Are there any questions that people have over there? Yeah, Mark, thank you very much for a very interesting uh, uh, program. And I have one question for you. You started at the beginning, and you were mentioning something about Lake Placid and Lake George and yeah, something about DEC. Could you just restate what you were saying about that? Yeah, so under the Clean Water Act, there's, there are... Uh, Stormwater permits that can be issued, and, and there are different categories. Some are municipal stormwater permits, some are industrial category permits, and 
Um, a lot of times they'll do a, an issue like a general permit, which kind of covers a broad portion of the, of the um, industry. And uh, we had to challenge a DEC decision, a DEC issuance of an industrial uh, stormwater permit because it would, have allow, it, would have, it would allow industrial discharges into class AA special waters like Lake George and Lake Placid. And so the judge wrote that those are categor, categorically, waterways like Lake George and Lake Placid were categorically off limits from industrial pollution. Yes, uh, Mark, thank you for your presentation. Speaking of permits, um, there are uh, groups of environmentalists who would uh, criticize these environmental laws as merely becoming permitting systems to allow pollution of the resources they were designed to protect. How do you respond to that criticism? Well, I don't disagree. Um, I think that they're right. You know, they're, it's the, the, in fact, the goal of the Clean Water Act was to eliminate pollution into our waterways by 1985. We're way beyond that. Um, it is. It's the framework we have. I mean, you know, it's hard to get anything. If you're talking about the federal level, look how difficult it is to get anything through. Um, I think there are a lot of tools. I think the Clean Water Act provides a good framework. It provides a lot of tools. The problem is it's not implemented and it's not enforced. So you'll see a lot of change when it's implemented and it's enforced. And that's where friends, you know, people like Chris come in to enforce the Clean Water Act because it's not always being done by the state or by the feds. Um, but I, I agree that we could have a we could have a much more ideal solution too. Hi, uh, my name is Carol Collins, and I hired Chris Novitsky twenty years ago. And <laughs> I think he's going to last. He's <laughs> done a wonderful job here today. <laughs> um, speaking of these narratives such as the Clean Water Act. Uh, we have something called AA Special here in Lake George. And of course, it's a narrative that protects the lake. Um, but it's, it's having a more, more difficult time as, as the development goes on in the basin. And I think the Waterkeeper Alliance has touched upon this, but the, narr the narrative at some point needs to be become standards, water quality standards, which we, we seem to be lacking, and it's holding back some of the protection measures we need. Uh, we're working on trying to get those standards now, but it's been a difficult path. And I'm wondering, have you had success across the nation in, in working on those, especially for a legal mesotrophic lake like Lake George? Yeah, no, you're right. That that I didn't touch on that in the priorities of the Clean Water Act, but in in the specifically around like the industrial agriculture space, there's a lack of like I think you're probably talking about numerical standards, right? In a lot in yes. a lot of cases, there are narrative standards of sort of like the water shouldn't look muddy or whatever the different narrative standard might be. And, um, you're right. The numerical standards are the ones that really are the ones that we need to have. Um, gives you an objective response as to whether it's, there's pollution going into that waterway. And, um, but there's, there's a reluctance sometimes, there's certainly a reluctance from those that are discharging to want to have um, numerical standards. And it's really hard to get it through EPA and, and stuff sometimes. We are, that is part of the priorities that we have under the Clean Water Act, absolutely. Um, it's like you say though, it's a tough, it's a tough road for sure. And good, good choice. <laughs> any any other questions for Mark? So I just want to thank you, Mark. Again, it was uh, inspiring. It was eye opening. Uh, but uh, nothing we don't already sense or or, or have some awareness of. And one of the big questions I have is, how do we, we, we're demonstrating it here at Lake George. We are getting people aboard across the aisle and across sectors. So we have the business community stepping up. We're the host of this event is participating in our road salt reduction initiative, Fort William Henry. 
And it seems to me, unless we do the same, and I know how hard this is, I, I understand where, where you're at in the Waterkeeper Alliance's role as an advocate, but if we can't create, build those bridges in real terms, and if we can't lead with that economic case, because mm -hmm. that's what we're doing here. As goes Lake George, the health of Lake George, so goes that lake-based economy. We lose the lake, we lose everything this region stands for. This is, you said it when you started, this is the queen of American lakes. This is one of the clearest, cleanest lakes in the world, close to major population centers. Businesses take note, not just tourism businesses, all businesses. So how do we bring the business, sorry to make a speech here, but how do we, <laughs> But, but, I, but it, it moves the dial, you know, nothing mm -hmm. talks. I mean, the strong, let's face it, the strongest lobby we have, whether it's in D.C. or Albany or anywhere, is the business lobby. How do we bring them to the table in a meaningful way that gives them a seat as a, not as an adversary, but as an ally? Because it, it seems to me until we can do that, we're going to be continuing to, pardon the pun, but to swim upstream. Yeah. No, 100%. And you know, what I didn't say earlier was, especially talking about the sort of the history of Hudson River Keeper and, and the start, start of Waterkeeper Alliance, is that our whole fundamental approach from our, our philosophy is that change happens at the local level. And that's where you're going to see progress. It's, it's, you, it's not a top-down imposition. It's where you can come together and bring joint solutions together. It's easier to hold local officials accountable. And, you know, that's where... I always use the example when I'm out in other places of talking about how change happens at the local level. It's a simple example, but it's an easy one. It's just that the state of New York, the governor and the legislature didn't decide to ban plastic bags. It happened because communities realized that there was a big plastic problem. And so they organized and they got together and they talked with their local grocery store, grocers and different bookstores, and they all came together and they developed a, a something that worked in their community. And then the next community took it and replicated it. And the next community took it and replicated it, and it bubbled up to the state. It's all about local making change. And that and the most effective local is when you can bring together different parties and business. We, we work with a number of businesses on uh, things. And I didn't you know, mention in the PFAS thing is there's a lot of businesses now that are getting, getting out of that and making sure they're not using it in their products. Starbucks is eliminating it from all their packaging. Patagonia is getting out of their waterproof jackets. Gore-Tex is getting out of their jackets. Um, they can be really powerful partners in pushing towards that solution. For sure. Good. Anyone else? Thanks, Bob. Thank you. Oh, one more. You oh. just when you thought. Oh, yep, yep. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Mark. Um, one, I might have missed it if it was said. Is this going to be available for anybody online after 3 o'clock today? I, not immediately, but in the future. Uh, yes, we we are taping this. We we are streaming it online, obviously, but we will have videos of all the clips, all the presentations at the Lake George Association dot org website. I'm sure we'll send an email out to all attendees, so they'll be aware of it. So yes, it will be. Cool, uh, uh, Mark or Chris. I'm I'm going to ask for something. Chris, I called you a couple times in the last year since I was here, and what I'm going to ask for, if, if it exists, just please interrupt me. Uh, and what I'm asking is, uh, I really appreciated the bucket demonstration. I love simplicity, and what I'm looking for, and maybe it does exist, but I'm looking for, like right here, I was here last year, I just mentioned, it's, for me it's like, I'm not a scientist. It's like drinking from a fire hose. I went to the, our town. I asked about brine. Uh, it wasn't time yet. Thank God we're being surrounded by towns. I'm sitting near guys who are doing it, surrounded by towns that are doing brine. So it's probably just inevitable. But I can't help but think that even if it comes to our town by way of whatever reason, that what I'm what I'm hoping for either exists or could be created is the elevator pitch that a guy like me who's not a scientist can go in and I went in, I said, there's great stuff happening and I did my best. But if there was just an elevator pitch 
either written, written ideally, just bullet points going down that one, anybody, anywhere on the planet for that matter can lay out to those who are still in the, in the shade, if not the dark. Um, I can't help but think it'd be immensely invaluable. And I'll finish with the one thing you did say to me, Chris, about six weeks ago. And you, said, you mentioned, uh, you, you weren't sure, I, I believe, that if this elevator pitch did exist, but you threw out one number and I went back with it. And if I got it correct, if I remember correctly, you said there was a five-year ROI, return on investment. And that was the one thing that I came, I came back with and I got attention right away. And I'm thinking if there were five or 10 or whatever of those, those talking points, I think it would be invaluable. Well, thanks. I, um, I'm glad I, it's a number that I can actually back up and I didn't you know, just make up on the fly. So, sorry, sorry, no, um, no, but that's the one, no, we, we found that, you know, when we were investing and working with these towns, that that's, that's what it was, it, you know, the investment, the, the grants that we provided. And, um, you know, I think if you want that elevator pitch, if you're on a long elevator ride, you should bring like Tim from town of Hague because he'll give you all the pitch that you need, but we can work on that. I think, yeah, the ROI is, is, is Eric talked about earlier, you know, it's the economics and, and it's the environmental side. You know, when we started working with the, um, the operators and letting them know about the science, yeah, we know that it's a fire hose. That's why we kind of brought in McKaylee to bring in the wool, you know, to kind of, not to pull wool over your eyes, but to kind of lighten the thing up a little bit. But I think, um, you know, when we talk about the economics, when we talk about the importance of the environment and, and talk about fishing and, and how, and I'm focusing on road salt right now. I, I don't know about the elevator pitch for PFAS or anything else, but you know, we can work on that. That's where I think, so we can get, yeah, you know, three or four important points like that, but you know, I would show them, you know, it's, it's longer than an elevator pitch, but I would show them, you know, this link for that presentation with the buckets. And I mean, I think that'll go far. Yeah. Was about the possibility of seeing this. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. That will be up, and all attendees will receive that link once Thank it's you. up on the website. All right. Great. Thanks. Thank you very much, Mark. Really appreciate it. And um, I apologize if there were bad jokes in there, but I, it's, it's going to be a long day. So uh, anyway, but we are also up to a, a great discussion point right now, panel discussion, where we want to bring up um, four experts, practitioners um, on to addressing the road salt issue and to talk about the concerns and the impacts that we are seeing park-wide in the Adirondack Park. Um, we know that uh, the most important resource, as Mark just said, in the Adirondack Park is its waters. I mean, that's one of the reasons that that park was established, was to protect the waters, protect it from damaging impacts of logging way back in the 19th century. Um, and it's been recognized lately with the uh, Randy Preston road salt reduction bill that, that went through uh, the legislature last year. And a few of our panelists are on that task force that was created. So. I would like to invite uh, Bob Kafin up, as well as Tracy Eldridge, as well as David Miller, and bring back Phil Sexton to start our panel discussion on the Adirondacks. Maybe we can uh, give them a hand while they're earn earning their free lunch, you know? So, as we said, um, you know, we, we've yeah, talked I, I, about the issues down. around uh, road salt and the way that it's impacted our waters. Uh, we've heard our local highway departments um, talk about the issues that, that surround them. Not, not only on the infrastructure, we had great questions on purchasing of materials. Um, we had some of our highway departments and the personnel talk about um, the need for 
a change in mindset or expectations. Uh, I put down maybe respect, you know, for those men and women that are doing a very difficult job. Um, so all these issues come around and, you know, to protect a place that is as special as the Adirondack Park, um, you know, we need to have collaboration. We need to find that balance. Um, and we need to keep an eye on the prize, which is to protect the park for what it was made for 120 plus years ago um, and to protect that for our children. So what I'd like to do is for each of the panelists, starting on the uh, left here with Bob, to introduce yourselves and maybe briefly describe you know, your background and your connection with the Adirondacks. Uh, thanks, Chris. Uh, I'm uh, an environmental lawyer by profession. Uh, I have lived either part-time or full-time in Warren County for 50 years. And since the early 80s, I've been active uh, in addressing many um, environmental issues, either uh, as a uh, lawyer for clients uh, or as a uh, citizen volunteer in nonprofit organizations. Uh, and over time, uh, I've been in many organizations in the Adirondacks, from the Adirondack Council, which is an environmental advocacy organization where I served as chair for a number of years, but I've also been on the Adirondack Regional Chamber of Commerce. So I've looked at Adirondack issues from both environmental uh, as well as uh, economic point of view. Uh, my introduction to um, uh, transportation uh, came when I was counsel to the uh, state senate uh, Committee on Investigations when we looked at uh, transportation problems that arose during the 1980 Winter Olympic Games in, uh, in Lake Placid. Uh, Governor Hochul appointed me to the uh, Adirondack uh, Road Salt Reduction Task Force in December, and on that task force I chaired the uh, training and outreach uh, work group. Tracy? Uh, thanks. I just want to say this, these stools are pretty high, so I tend to fall off stages. So if I fall, if I fall off, I'll catch Devin, you. Uh, yeah. you can bring up the so, other chair yeah, if you yeah. like. So uh, basically, I'm a uh, lifelong resident of the Adirondack Park. I grew up in uh, Indian Lake, um, live there to this day. Um, next, next month, I'll have been there 58 years. Um, I... Uh, in the county highway superintendent for uh, Hamilton County and have been in that position for 18 years. Um, we also uh, contract out for New York State DOT just over 100 lane miles of snow and ice. Um, and, you know, uh, this is, it's not easy, the task force and what our job is ahead of us because um, there's a lot of important issues. Um, I have, you know, children that have came back to live in Hamilton County. I've got three grandchildren now. Um, I want, you know, I'm concerned about the environment, um, but I'm also concerned about safe travel and there's many things we can do working together to reduce salt for sure. Um, as Bob mentioned, I, um, I was appointed to the task force by Governor Hochul also, um, and I had been, you know, had the pleasure to meet a lot of good people and that, you know, we may not all agree but we can agree on one thing, that roll salt's bad. And I believe um, you are the, currently the superintendent of Hamilton County. That is so correct, yes. Yeah. Uh, Dave? Hi, I'm David Miller. I'm the clean water coordinator for the Adirondack Council. Been doing that for about seven years now, uh, but I've been involved in environmental conservation as well as some state government posts, as you'll see from my resume, for over 40 years. Uh, going back to days of early days with Scenic Hudson in the 80s where I knew Bob Boyle and the Hudson River Fishermen's Association all the way up till today and knowing Chris is a water keeper here on Lake George. I've been involved in many Adirondack issues in the 20 years that I led Audubon. I was involved Audubon, New York. I led efforts in the Adirondacks. I've also been on the Adirondack Research Consortium Board for some dozen years or more. Uh, and road salt, as well as septic systems, as well as clean water infrastructure, is all in my bailiwick in working for clean water in the Adirondacks. Thanks, Dave. And Phil, reintroduce you. <laughs> Welcome Hello back. again. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so if it's not obvious by now, we're, we're, we're the folks, uh, my team and I are the folks that are really sort of the architects behind the, uh, the standards that are being practiced here in Lake George and other places. We've, we've heard a little bit about Lake Placid. Um, so we're, we're uh, involved in the measuring and monitoring there as well. Been partnering with ADK Action as well. And so just really, really happy to be a part of scaling this effort. So I'm, I'm, I'm the one person on the panel that's not a resident of, of the Adirondacks, but it's my dream. Um, I've, I swim in as many lakes as I can here anytime I can jump in. Um, uh, I'm still trying to finish the high peaks. And um, I've got an interesting backstory to my, my passion for the Adirondacks actually starts from way back with my father. If, if anybody's old enough, my father owned what was called the Paseco General Store, which has been gone a long, long time, but that was his store. And then he was also a journalist uh, in many ways. And he, uh, he was the publisher of something called the Adirondack Trail Markers. Anybody ever heard of that? So it's, it's, uh, it's the magazine that happened right before Adirondack Life, basically. So some, somewhere in there, there was a deal made and um, that somehow has something to do with how Adirondack Life exists today. So that's sort of my backstory and why I'm so passionate about this area. Thanks. Um, road salt is a necessity to provide safe roads for residents and everybody who lives and recreates in the Adirondacks. But as we've heard, road salt carries environmental concerns and issues. Uh, what do you see as the major issue with road salt in the park? Is it an environmental issue, a health issue, a transportation issue? Is it a budgetary issue? Um, and, and I kind of handle this how you guys want to do it. I, we don't need to go down. I could pick on you if you want. Or <laughs> you can just kind of speak up. I think it's all of those, mm -hmm. all of them across the board. Um, they're all they're all very important. Um, we have to continue to advocate. As you know, I'm on the best management practices group along with Phil and Kevin Hage, also everybody I'm sure knows in this room, and several other great people, Joe Martens. Um, it, it's it's all part. It's it's um, the fact that we are you know, as practitioners, as a highway superintendent, and many of the practitioners in this room, um, we tend to be under a lot of pressure um, from the, the traveling public to maintain our roads. You know, we know what the highway law says, um, but then we also know um, what, what the traveling public is. It's gonna take a lot of education, public education, people learning to slow down in winter driving conditions. And that's a big task with the liability issues that we, we face, both environmentally and pers personal injury type <laughs> issues. Now, I, I come from it obviously from an environmental perspective and with the data and the science and the contamination to our waterways and, and drinking water and so forth. But if I were to answer the question, I'd say the biggest issue is balance to build on what Terry said. And how do you craft a balanced approach, like has been discussed here on a park-wide basis, at all levels to move this forward and move this forward aggressively. So I think that's the biggest issue, crafting the balance and successes from here to scale, whether that scale is New York State or whether that scale is a small village in the middle of the Adirondacks. You know, I, I think the uh, issue uh, is not a this or that, and I'm, I'm really repeating and, and agreeing with um, Tracy and, and Dave. Uh, what we have are competing demands, and we tend to uh, favor the demand that we like the most and invalidate everybody else's demand. But in fact, what we have are valid, d valid interests that are not 100% reconcilable, and the biggest problem is figuring out how to reconcile them in a way that acknowledges the validity of every uh, valid interest, but gives way to the competing valid interest so that you do get uh, an outcome uh, that isn't in polar terms, this or that, but which produces the fairest result, which um, is balance. And, you know, as a follow-up to that, Bob, I mean, you, obviously, on the task force, um, 
in the discussions. Is there, you know, what was the process? There was a couple of public meetings, as I recall. And for the record, I'm I'm a recently appointed person on the task force. Well, so mm -hmm. all the hard work's <laughs> been done by by these gentlemen and the women on that. But um, but about the process, what what could you talk about the process? And maybe I'll start with Phil since he was quiet on the line. You know, the process and and how did that go forward? And what what did you learn from the process? I think, I think what was interesting in the beginning was once the task force was appointed and assembled, we had to decide how to break down the legislation into sort of digestible chunks. And so what we ended up, uh, to Tracy's point, we ended up breaking out into different working groups that, that focused on different sections of it. So we, there's a working group on, related to the, the actual impacts of SALT and trying to, to study and report out on that. Um, there's a working group for the outreach and the training efforts that we think are gonna be, need to be recommended. There's another working group for best, best practices and actually assembling the pilots. And then um, the last is the, uh, the monitoring. Uh, so how, you know, how do we actually monitor any kind of results that we may get out of that? So I think that was important to sort of focus on, so what, what, are, what are the different aspects of this that we have to break down? I think, then I think balancing that with going back to sort of the original question, what I, what I found was most interesting as this was assembled is how we're being led is through a co-chair structure. So, and I think that's representative of really the complication of this issue. So, I mean, the SALT itself is simple enough but from my point of view as a practitioner, you know, there are ways to reduce the salt, but it's all the constraints and all the competing priorities that everyone else spoke about that I think is the complication. So when you think about the task force being co-chaired by DOT, um, DEC, and then we also have uh, Department of Health uh, that plays a role in this and, and the Adirondack Park Agency. So each one of those sort of have these competing priorities, not because somebody's being selfish, but uh, you know, business continuity and safety is, is then having to compete with environment, is then having to compete with, yeah, but this is all really bad for our health. And then, oh, by the way, we're focusing on this in the Adirondack Park. And so there's an, another layer of constraints or challenges that, that are within that. And so, you know, this, this has been a great lesson for me, this process, because, um, you know, I've, I've not really ever been involved in, in government work, per se, at a, at a legislative level. So as they say, you know, this is how the sausage is made. And so I think in this case, this is a really, this is a really tough one to, to balance, right? Chris, could I? It, it's yeah. interesting as you talk about the process, because I only want to bring the process back even before the task force was formed. Mm -hmm. And the process of what you're all doing here, and I've been to all these road salts, I think, for five or six years, Chris, now, and all the work that you've done uh, here and commendable is part of the process. We talked about the bubbling up before. It was part of the process of bubbling up and showing it could be done. And we worked hard at the Adirondack Council with our legislative staff in Albany to help write the legislation, to help get statewide support of the legislation, to help push for nominees from folks like that are here today to help move that process forward because we wanted to ensure there would be a process where the sausage making you talk about uh, was created but in a way that removed those barriers and biases and silos so everybody could get into a room and find the balance that all you have found. So the first step of the process in honor of Randy who believed in that same process with the working groups that he put together prior to his passing was really uh, an important thing to remember as we enter into the final stages of the task force, why it was created, to help replicate what you've done here on a statewide basis. Chris, if you'll take another minute on this. Absolutely. Because um, we're insiders, so we assume everybody knows everything that we know, and it's yeah. not the case. The, the, in addition to the four, the four state agencies mentioned, had, each had a representative on the task force. And then there was room for nine citizen representatives. Of the, uh, um, and Chris was the last to join, of the eight before that, three were representatives of uh, 
local government. In other words, they weren't designated in the statute to be representatives of local government, or the local government was supposed to be represented. But three of the people that were appointed were from the uh, uh, county and, uh, and town, town levels. So we had three uh, representatives. Then we had a couple of scientists. Uh, we had a few citizen uh, activists. Um, we had one a professional uh, winter management uh, person. So there was a balance of uh, interest uh, represented. And then um, um, we heard about, Phil talked about the four work groups. Uh, the work groups uh, met almost weekly for two months in March and April. So this was a, a working bunch of people who got together on a regular basis uh, to discuss issues, uh, to give each other assignments, and to report back at the, at the next meeting. So there was an intensive, work-heavy uh, uh, time. And at the end of each of those times, there was a written product produced that represented everybody's homework. And then the task force as a whole met a number of times to roll up into a comprehensive document the inputs from each of the, the work groups. Uh, so uh, this was an, a very hands-on project. Uh, from my own personal perspective, it was a wonderfully collaborative and cooperative group of extremely experienced and intelligent uh, and decent uh, people. It was a pleasure to be among them. I, I got more educated than I was educating. Uh, but it was a very good process. We don't have a result yet, though. The, the proof of the pudding, they say, is in the eating, and we still have to wait for that. Mm -hmm. And I would like to field any questions people have from the audience. Uh, we have one right here to start off with. Just, just so you're aware, I will divulge it. I did throw out a few questions to the panelists before to get this, you know, grease the, the pump, but... Now they're the spotlights on. This is very interesting. So how long do you think it will be before you're at a point where you're ready to make your recommendation to the chair of the task force, which I would assume would find its way up to the governor? <laughs> you know, That's a good question. Nobody wants to I, I, well, I should have prefaced that we don't want to. <laughs> As a, non, the final as a non-task force member on the panel uh, and an advocate for the task force, I would just say, while the deadline has passed from the legislation of when the final report was to be released and published, we are hopeful that the task force will find common ground to push forward a comprehensive report in the near future. That's the best I can say from watching it from the outside. I, was, I would say this um, to Bob's point. <clears throat> All of us on the task force had a lot to learn too. We had our own expertise. But we, had to we, we had a lot to learn on the other side. And so we all recognized, and Bob and Phil can agree or disagree with me, this road salt reduction is much more complex than meets the eye. We, yes, we can sit here and say, all, we're doing good work um, with salt reduction, but we can go a lot farther, but it's gonna take um, a lot of collaboration and a lot of, even after the draft report comes out, is further, further work um, as far as that. In, um, but it is, you know, it, it was an eye-opening um, experience and still is. Um, for me, you know, in my personal period, and, and to get to know everybody, we all understand. We don't, even as highway superintendents, who sometimes are looked at as non-environmentalists, we hate salt as much as the people that the scientists that know salt's bad for water. We we see what it does to our infrastructure. We see what it does to bridges. We see what it does to vehicles. Um, so we understand that too. I think all of us on this task force um, wants the end goal is to be able to reduce road salt by a lot. That said, we also, and I'll take it from Phil's thing, I would rather have a good report than a hurried report. Yeah. Great. Thank you. 
question over here. How likely are the recommendations from the task force to be implemented beyond the Adirondack uh, Park area throughout New York State? Good question. <laughs> well, we also would need them implemented within the Adirondack Park because right. the task force uh, only uh, has the power to make uh, recommendations. Um, I have two thoughts on this that I'd like to share. One is that when the report comes out, the very first thing that we need is a state-sponsored and paid-for set of pilot programs uh, to uh, demonstrate uh, what uh, can be done with a variety of uh, winter road management uh, strategies designed to use less salt. Now, we've been lucky in that some municipalities have already engaged in some pilot projects, particularly here in the, in the Lake George uh, uh, watershed, but we really need uh, uh, more tryouts to see what, what <clears throat> will happen, and the state has to take a, a, a lead on that, and then we really need a um, uh, honest and independent uh, monitoring of the results of the pilot projects so we can see what effect, if any, they had, and then we have to be good scientists. Scientists, scientists uh, promulgate hypotheses, and then they test them in experiments, and they look at the results. And if the results don't bear out the hypothesis, they don't throw up their hands in despair and go away. They revisit their premises, they reformulate their hypothesis, and they do more tests. This is a long, long haul. And the pilot project is the very first uh, uh, piece of that. Uh, and we're not going to get it even done in the Adirondacks without some pilot projects with follow-up. And I'd Frick. say that the, the reason the legislation was written specifically for the Adirondacks and not statewide was due to this complexity of the issue, was due to the amount of groundwork that had been done in this region, and was due to the need to do pilot projects to test it moving forward in the legislation. So then things learned from this could then be applied elsewhere in the state and maybe there'll be similar initiatives, but we needed to create an entity and an effort uh, that was manageable. And the Adirondack Park was that manageable area. And if I could just add that there are two or three current pilots that I'm aware of DOT has right now. One of them on Route 9N, just from the village here up to Tongue Mountain, um, which the Lake George Association and the Waterkeeper actually have an active monitoring program on that we are producing a final report after four years of studying um, for Lake Champlain Sea Grant at the end of this year. We're writing the final report now. There's one up on Route 86 up in Wilmington, Lake Placid area. And then I believe um, they have one just outside of the park in South Glens Falls, I believe. So just there are some pilots ongoing right now. Sorry, Phil? I just wanted to add, we, we had a conversation earlier about this with Saratoga Lake, right? But I, I think when you look at the model here, you know, it, what inspires change? What enables change? It's, it, it's awareness and it's consequence, right? And I think sometimes consequence can be positive though. It doesn't always have to be painful, right? So our, our approach that you've been hearing here is, is never punitive, it's more to incentivize. And I think that's, I'm, I'm generally not a fan of regulation. Um, I think in this case though, you, if you think about it in terms of like the, the law of diffusion and innovation, right? So you, you've heard from some of the innovators here and in the, in the early adopters and the middle adopters and then eventually we're gonna have to get to the laggards, right? And there's probably gonna be more laggards in this than there are sort of adopters. At least that's, that's generally what it sort of looks like. So at some point, there might have to be some teeth to this too, right? And I think that's, that's not necessarily something that uh, I, I could say is being recommended, but it, it may have to be something that's considered. Because I, I, I say it all along, I mean, we, we've been working on this here for, you know, you've heard, already heard about eight years. And I would tell you the first five years, we were really slow to move. The last three years, we're finally picking up some speed on this. Um, but. Yeah, we have to ask the question, how important of an issue is this really? And so then that sort of answers the question, so what are you willing to do about it? Right, so I think, and I think that's gonna carry all the way up to a state level at some point, I would imagine I have to. Thanks. Um, 
the best practices and the pilots is only one section of what the task force focused on. Um, I'm particularly interested in the outreach and training, the mm. impacts of SALT. Um, those aspects that have been addressed in the task force, do they have to wait for the pilot study or will there be other actions taken that will initiate characterization of the impacts or start to consider how best to develop those outreach activities to the, to the public or to other groups that use SALT? I guess that was my work group, so. <laughs> You're up. Uh, You're up. So, so um, outreach, which is one word, uh, turns out to have um, a, a host of components to it. And uh, I believe that the task force uh, is going to recommend uh, an immediate outreach program and that the program not be a program, but programs. In other words, each, there has to be an identification of audiences who you want to reach. And for each audience, there has to be a, a message that is uh, tailored to the audience and techniques of delivering the message to which the audience will be uh, responsive. But a great deal here uh, is uh, based upon, as we've heard, from earlier panelists today, and as Tracy uh, eloquently expressed earlier, uh, there's a lot of motivations that people feel that come from what they know and what they, what they believe. And we have to begin to change some uh, perceptions. Uh, some of it is public perception. What is the expectation for safe road management in the, in the wintertime? And, and what are the costs of different levels of management? Because it's not a free, not a free lunch. Uh, there's uh, uh, also uh, a need, uh, as we heard in the presentations this morning, uh, to teach an outreach uh, to the people that are on the front lines delivering the service. And there's a slightly different message to the people who supervise them. Uh, and it's, and, and uh, the, the um, uh, uh, town supervisors who, who call up the uh, highway superintendent and complain that they didn't do what they were supposed to do, and therefore put pressure uh, to divert resources in a way that may not be the most sensible town-wide uh, management strategy. So you can't wait around uh, in trying to change public attitudes, the attitudes of policymakers, and the attitudes of people who are charged with delivering uh, winter road management services. So that doesn't have to wait for a pilot project at all. Uh, on the training, once there's some agreement as to what are the best management uh, practices that ought to be employed, and I think we're rapidly coming to a, a society-wide consensus on that, there is a need to train the people who are <coughs> going to deliver those services. And we heard quite well today uh, um, from uh, the person who drives the truck to the person who supervises and how important uh, peer training is. And there has to be a need to train the trainers at the peer level so that the people receiving the training are receiving training from uh, trusted teachers in whom they have confidence and who believe we're going to bear the same burden, so to speak, uh, that they will bear if they follow out, follow the training that they're given. I think to add to that then is, uh, so I work with Bob on this group as well, but so breaking that right down, it's, you know, it's, it's outreach at a policy level, at a practice level, and at a constituent level, really. So, you know, constituents are all of us in this room actually drive on roads, and then some of us are, you know, customers of public parking spaces and those kinds of things. So, you know, at the end of the day, you've got to, you've got to speak to each of those. The, that whole bucket thing you saw this morning and, and the results of that, that only happens when at a policy level that's, that they're allowed to do that first. So a lot of times we, we chase after, let's just chase after and, and, and train the operators, the people that are applying that salt. They're, they're simply just applying what they're told to apply, right? And sometimes even at a policy level, um, you know, from the state on down, state, county, town, village, I don't care who it is, it's, it's we as the customers, the constituents that are driving the level of service expectation in many cases. So we, you know, we, 
in the contractor world, we call it the customer's expectation creep, right? So we've, we've creeped our expectations way higher than it ever used to be. So we expect bare roads while it's snowing. And so, but I, I've also advocated, I don't think we're gonna be able to change that expectation. So now we actually have to change the methods and, and the, the human behavior aspect of how we achieve that level of service. And so what, you're, what you saw here earlier today with the buckets is, there is a way to do it, um, but it sure takes a heck of a lot of time. And half the time that it's taken us to get to that point has not been at a practice level. It's been getting their, their policymakers to let them do it, right? To, to give them some courage to say, yes, you can go ahead and do this and, and we'll risk the extra phone call that somebody makes because they see something different. You know, everybody wants to see the salt on the road. They want to hear the crunch under the tires. So even when, when we convert to lines in the road, takes a couple of years before people even understand, well, what the heck are these things? How come I don't have what I used to have, right? And the sand thing is the same example that we talked about earlier. If they don't see the dirty snow, they think that there's a lower level of service being achieved for some reason, right? So you mentioned the possible need for uh, mandates or regulations. Uh, will they, uh, the task force also be recommending incentives or grants or uh, 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 financing of some of these pilot projects to uh, promote faster implementation of these recommendations? I'll just say yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll just say, since, since non-official, that there are sources of funds within the Water Infrastructure and Investment Act. There's a road salt storage category that has over $50 million statewide, and you could expand that and put more funds into that to include equipment. So there are different mechanisms in the New York State budget under clean water programs that could help fund that. I just want to say on this whole policy end, remember we're, we talked about here and everything we've talked about here pretty much has been until a little later, uh, the local policies and getting the local town boards and the local supervisors involved in the local drivers and plow and, 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 and uh, you know, uh, public works, so forth. But we got this at a macro level. We have the State Department of Transportation, and they put down about 75% of the road salt on 25% of the roads. We know the research, we know the science, we know there are practices, we know they're starting to do some pilots, thanks to Chris and others. But that's a big silo in itself, and that's a big cultural challenge in itself. And so we need to be conscious of that, and our hope is that the task force report will come out and break and make a cultural change in large agencies, we call them aircraft carriers, you know, and help them shift and make cultural changes there as we're also making them on the local level. So it may not be as much about mandates as cultural change and moving in new directions uh, to, 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 to have these same end results while protecting the environment and our citizens' wells. I would answer yes to that question as Phil, just yes. Um, but to Bob's point earlier, we face um, criticism um, from both sides of the spectrum. As Bob mentioned, town supervisor, um, social media, um, get out on the roads, they're doing a horrible job. There's an interest in all, why aren't they out there? Um, a law enforcement official, hey, the road's slippery, get out here when really it may not be necessary. Um, but we tend to take the conservative safe approach, which leads to overuse of whatever the material you're using. Um, but you know, the picture that you see on the screen right there, that's kind of a, that's a misleading picture there in the fact that, and this is, the, this is on the state legislature and governor, and this is not a political statement. That's a very, very well new, newer road. They all should be looking like that in the, <laughs> in the Adirondack Park. If, if we are absolutely serious about reducing salt, as much as we can do, and the, these gentlemen in this room and done, as Phil's worked hard, that reduction would go down big time if they spent the money in infrastructure to make all roads look like that right there. Um, and it's gonna take funding. <laughs> We need to 
you know, my, my estimation in, in both Bobby and uh, Phil have heard it. Um, we need to look at selective trimming of the canopies to let natural light in. We need to, as uh, this gentleman said about salt storage, grants are very complicated sometimes. Some small towns don't have the knowledge to go through and jump through the hoops of those grants. I know in my county, we're very desperate for uh, proper storage for sand and so on ice control. Um, but, but still, our legislators, they are looking at the dial. Not that they aren't concerned about the environment, but there's a lot of other needs. As, we're, we're, as we've all found on this, this task force, there's competing interests here. There is an easy solution if we could all get to that, you know, get to it and understand that wintertime driving is different mm -hmm. than summertime driving. Cultural change. Cultural change. Slow down. Yes. Um, you know, can f fix our road infrastructure. So, you know, I don't care if you have a live edge plow or whatever. Typically, rutting and roads are not square. It, it still c creates more. You got to use more material to clear that road up. Um, so that's just, I'm hoping this applies pressure to the state legislature, because this is not a political issue in my mind. This is about safety all the way around, whether it's health, traveling public, uh, you know, we have to have medicine, we have to have fire, ambulance protection, all that stuff. We have to do business, as Phil said, someone said, I think earlier, business world still, can, still goes on. We can find solutions. We can, the task work, we can get there. It's just, we've got to be allowed to do it. Mm -hmm. what, what I might just add, because I, I only said yes, so I'm going to add a couple more <laughs> words to it. <laughs> no, sorry. Huh? Yeah. So, but to, to, your, to your question of mandate or regulation, I, I personally don't believe this is something that you can regulate. It's too fragmented of an issue. So you can go ahead and try to police it, but it's not going to happen. And so that's why I go back to sort of my, my background, which really is more at an entrepreneurial level. I, I think taking an entrepreneurial approach to this and, and figuring out what the incentives are to, to following these practices is really what it boils down to. I think money talks. So I think that's a piece of it. I mean, less salt just means, you know, less money, right? Less cost. Um, so, but, but early on, one of the things that I had to do, even with the town of Hague, was we had to actually convince folks, like we started seeing savings, but then it almost created a, a negative consequence. It was like, oh, great. Well, then now we can actually lower the budget. So somebody's going to want to, you know, whoever the town supervisor is of today, and I'm not trying to tease you guys, but it's like, you want to be able to say you lowered taxes. Don't lower taxes with that budget. You know, you heard Edinburgh, man. I mean, they, they, they don't have a, a pot to pee in with that budget, but they're making it work and they're reinvesting. So they're, they're, they're allowed to keep that budget, even though they're saving, to then reinvest in the technology and the measuring and the training and everything else. That's, that's what has really been inspired here. And I, so I think that's the scalable model that we can, that we can, we can follow. Um, I think you've made some great points, all of you. Um, you've talked about state issues, the task force. I'm wondering what you think about the Adirondacks, the local level, uh, especially here in Lake George, where a lot of people um, leave after what we call the season, mm. and they're not here in the winter. And they're not aware of a lot of the problems that are going on, um, all the particulars. Lots of details were discussed that most people, uh, homeowners, are really not even aware of. And uh, even though I know in certain parts of the Adirondacks there's skiing and winter sports, uh, that might be a little bit different. But do you have any thoughts about how do you bring it down to the grassroots level to educate people who vote to their local towns and to the state uh, or, or just have influence? Um, how do you educate them to know what they should be um, bringing to their local towns and state? Well, 
Well, I think here um, you really have, um, for the seasonal residents, um, the um, potential um, adverse impacts of salt on the resources that are the reason they come seasonally is probably the way to go. So for people who live here year round, when you try to do the balance, uh, safe roads is quite important. For the seasonal residents, um, safe roads in the winter is much uh, lesser of an issue, but clean water, either to drink if they have wells on the side of a road, or to have recreation in for whatever purpose, whether you're swimming or fishing, um, it is a big issue for them. So I think if you can do the public outreach in a way that ties the problems of winter road management, the value of the natural resources that the seasonal residents depend on, you can make get the message yeah, through. But that's why I talked before about needing to define the audiences. And there are different messages for different audiences. And you have to find your audience and figure out what it is that motivates them to act in a certain way and tailor your message to do that. If I could, um, I would like to field one of the chat room questions, and that'll about do it unless you guys want to one. I just one thought, one other thought after the question, if I could, or before. Sure. Here, go to the question. So we kind of already touched on the DOT pilot studies, but someone had a question as to how has the task force identified priority areas or communities for salt reduction and or test pilot slash case study scenarios? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know if we can answer. I don't think Of course we can. that's got to go to me, right? <laughs> um, yeah. Just, you know, I'm sure people understand until it's public. Yeah, not, I don't think. Yeah. yeah, I don't think we can. So, but yes, for sure. Yeah, and okay. Dave, if you, yeah. I, uh, we got about two minutes left. I'd like to give each one, okay, uh, you know, a half minute, yeah, or so to close start up. with me or Bob. Yeah, start with you. Okay, Thanks, I, 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 I thank this opportunity. I thank the members of the task force. I think it's really important. You know, they're not just looking at what's going on in New York State. They're looking at what's going on across the country. They're some of the top minds in the country on this issue. And what comes out of this is going to be vitally important for the future of the Adirondacks and the future of New York State. It has to be policy based. It has to be culturally based, slow down, issues like that, expectations, work of Adirondack action, LGA, others. But it also has to break down silos. And in doing so, finding pathways for solutions, whether on a statewide level or on a local level, and doing it with somebody driving the bus. The biggest thing that's important to come out, one of the biggest things to come, is leadership from New York State, and leadership to adopt at New York State level the advice of this task force and help drive the bus and lead by example. So that's my, one of my biggest hopes and expectations, that this process will enable New York State to drive the bus and lead by example. Use the buckets. <laughs> Um, I am taking those home. <laughs> Trace, <laughs> Tracy, your expectations oh, uh, are closing thought. Uh, I appreciate the invite, uh, Chris. Um, I appreciate it because this is an important issue. Um, it is important to me, you know, and just want to say we can do this. I think that we're heading in the right direction. It's not going to be overnight, as Phil and a lot of the gentlemen in this room know. Um, you know, as Bob mentioned a little earlier, you know, we've had help. DOT has been a tremendous resource. DEC has been a tremendous resource. Department of Health, helping the task force. We're, we are, we all nine of us, or whatever the official number is with the agencies, we are in agreement on this. It's just how to get there and how to do it. You know, we all know it's bad, but there's, it's got to be a balanced approach mm -hmm. and going forward. So I look, I look forward to the continuing work on it. Thank Thanks. you. Bill, closing thought? Yeah, I think I'll just spin off of Debbie's question even with this. I, you know, I believe, you know, a lot of this is, is really a, I think business sort of fixes this. And I'm not saying, I think it'd be a public-private sort of enterprise in which, you know, you, you take a business approach to this, right? So when you, when you save on salt, you save money. When you save on salt, you save the environment. 
So, and, and, it, and it solves the health issue as well. But I think you market it the same way then. So that I think there's salesmanship involved with this. And I, I'm thinking back, does everybody remember the Got Milk commercial, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> or that campaign? That was brilliant, right? Mm -hmm. So like, so we, we, that's what this needs. I'm, I'm, you know, th there's enough people in the room that know what's going on with this salt thing. But generally speaking, this is an invisible epidemic. Almost nobody knows that this is a problem, really. So it, it requires some marketing. Quite frankly, I think I think if more people really understood the impacts of this, then they would understand why they're starting to see a change in, in, the, in the level of service or in the change in the approach of service. Right. So but, but it's just a marketing a marketing plan. Thanks. Bob, yeah, th this is not a sprint. Mm. <laughs> this this is right. a marathon. And even if you look at the arc that we've we've talked about today, Sawyer pointed out that almost 10 years ago, uh, ADK Action put together the first interagency group uh, to begin to look at that. The task force in part is an outgrowth of that and has four state agencies on it, representation from the local government and also private citizens. Um, some things have been on hold for two years waiting for the task force report as if that was going to be the end all and be all. It won't be. Uh, they're, uh, uh, it, even as well-informed and sensible as the report will be, it's not going to do the trick. Uh, there's got to be a post-task force mechanism uh, to oversee the implementation of the task force recommendations, to monitor progress, to update recommendations based on new science and monitoring results, uh, and also to uh, blow the whistle when resistance and sabotage uh, up here from those who don't want to change their attitudes or behavior. So it, it's a long haul and uh, uh, I'm happy I was able to play some small role in it and look forward to seeing what happens next. Great, I wanna have everyone give you a round of applause. Thanks for sitting up here under the lights and, and sharing your thoughts what you could with us. So, and thank you for your, your time on this because we know as a took a lot of time because you guys worked hard on this. Um, we have reached our final presenter. I will kind of reset this. Um, our final presenter is Joe Thompson, who is currently a senior transportation analyst with New York State Region 1. He's a graduate of St. Lawrence University, so he does know the North Country. He's been with New York State DOT, I think, nearly for 30 years. Um, today, he will update us on his multi-state project to apply technology to specialized winter maintenance. So if we could bring Joe Thompson up and welcome him to the podium. Thanks, Chris. Green Green button. Yep. Okay. Thanks, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, it's uh, thank you, Chris, for uh, the invite. It's really nice to to be here to talk about something positive. And a lot of times we've we've talked about it in the past that uh, Department of Transportation is doing a lot of good things, and we don't promote ourselves enough. And this is a great opportunity to promote one of the projects that we're working on. Um, just by a quick show of hands. How many people are familiar with clear roads? So, so about half. So clear roads is a, a 37 member state uh, consortium. It's a pooled fund. And uh, we get together, they get together twice a year and discuss uh, research projects and do a tremendous amount of research. But clearroads.org is the website and tremendous depth of information, research, training materials, an outstanding resource for anyone to look into. So I, I uh, strongly suggest if you haven't seen it, that you go look at clearroads.org and you can see this research. And the research I'm talking about today is using GIS to highlight highway segments sensitive to de-icing materials. So <clears throat> back in 2018, when I was a snow and ice program manager for New York State, uh, out in India, it was my first year and I presented this project and it, it didn't get voted in. So I was kind of upset. I think this is a great project, why didn't it make it? And then realized that as time goes on, you have, to get, you have to get people behind you to do it. 
So the other states that I enlisted into doing this were Massachusetts, so they are the co-sponsor. Maine jumped on board, Pennsylvania jumped on board, uh, Utah, Illinois, uh, Oregon, and Colorado were all, the, all their states that are on the, on the committee. And uh, it, it met with, uh, it was really well received the second time around, so it was uh, undeterred that we moved on. So here's just, uh, you see the states and the representatives that were here. Mark Goldstein from Massachusetts, I was actually hoping that he'd be here today because he's got uh, a role in it and Massachusetts has developed a tool. If you do a Google, Google search on it, you'd be able to see it, but they've got a, a GIS interactive map with locations that are sensitive and low salt locations. The project goal <coughs> was to uh, improve operational planning by developing an easy to use GIS tool that will help, help agencies across the country, not just New York State, identify road segments that were vulnerable to environmental resources um, that may be amp impacted by snow and ice materials. That's a, that's a mouthful, but they wanted it to, to cover everything. The guys from Montana were more worried about mountain goats coming down and getting hit by cars because they were licking salt off the shoulder. So um, they wanted it to cover everything. But really what we're trying to identify here is highway segments that are uh, susceptible to chlorides and to sodium. So I'll apologize ahead of time for this, uh, this next slide because when I was first doing this, it was, you know, this is supposed to be the where part of it. And also, you know, if you have a big problem, how do you address it? So everyone's seen the, the old, you know, how do you eat an elephant? And my, my bad dad joke is not one bite at a time, but one beat at a time. So. I know, I always get the same amount of laughs, it's, it's horrible. <laughs> but uh, the RFP when it went out to the, uh, <laughs> the, the, uh, the states and the, the host agency for Clear Roads is in Minnesota. So um, a, lot of the, a lot of the folks that came back with it were, were from uh, the Midwest. But uh, the ask was for these six tasks. The first was a literature review, then a survey of practice compile and analyze those results, and then uh, the meat and potatoes of the whole project was develop a resource prioritiz prioritization metrics, and then uh, a geospatial tool, a GIS tool that people could use to identify these locations, and then the final, the final report. Um, one of the indications that you kind of hit a home run with a project for this one was you know, typically you'll get like three or four responses. For this, we got 10 really qualified, excellent um, outfits that responded to it. And for our committee, we said, well, okay, we wanna focus on the proposal content, the, their understanding, their experience and qualifications, what kind of environmental experience do they have with the firm, the work plan approach, the deliverables. And then for those deliverables, focus on that task for the prioritization metrics and then the GIS tool itself, along with the instructions on how to use it. <clears throat> we looked at all these different, these, these were the, the folks that uh, submitted proposals to it. Like I said, you see most of them are from Minnesota, but we also had Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, North Dakota, and Iowa. And um, we went through each one of them, and this was, a, again, be careful what you wish for, because I had probably about 400 pages of proposal to look at. And, and the committee to look at. But um, this was just a real brief look at, at um, how we drove it down into each one of the proposals and, and rated them. For New York State, we enlisted uh, Carl Kokosberger as our environmental subject, subject matter expert. So he looked at all those, that portion of it. I looked at the snow and ice portion of it. And um, Kevin Hunt is our GIS specialist and he looked at it, the GIS portion of it. SRF was a, hands down the, the group that was the best because they had, in their proposal, had already kind of done this in, in, in a certain sense. So for, for us, it was a no brainer to pick them, pick them first. And they've already you know, come up with this sensitivity weighting tool where you could put distance to wetlands, distance to water, soil types, accessibility, and bring it in there. So um, they, they hit the ground running and finally, uh, came back with their first task, which was a literature review where they asked about salt transport, water quality, impacts to lakes and streams, 
impacts to groundwater, surface, surface impacts, soils, vegetation, fish and wildlife, and conclusions. Um, one of the things, in, and uh, I don't know if he's here anymore, but the elevator talk about brine and transport. When I'm doing training for our, our guys, I said, when, a, when salt leaves the back of the truck, it does one of four things. And three of those things are potentially wasteful or, or are wasteful. The truck, or the salt comes off the back of the truck and it either one, bounces off the road because the truck might be going too fast, lands on the road, but then gets blown off by traffic into the ditch and it's ineffective. It stays on the road and the temperature might be cold, it gets suspended and then it gets plowed off the road or it turns to brine and does its job. So that's a, kind of the elevator talk to why, why go to brine? That's, uh, that's the way to go. But when you're talking about transport, that's the salt in the ditch. Looking at task four, um, what the, the data inputs they, they came up with, there was 19 possible and how they ranked them was based on the availability, the utility, the quality, and uh, of those 19, we divided them up into four groups, the roadway, biological, geological, and water resource. These are all those, and the ones that were included, included if data was available, and then not included, but could be included later. The roadway descriptors. If it's green, it was included out of the gate. Center lines, uh, lane miles, posted speed, drainage, um, again, surface type, AADT, shading, tree canopy, stuff that can be added later. The biological descriptors were land cover, endangered species, critical wildlife, and geological, geological descriptors was the soil type. Water resource descriptors are the well locations if you have them. Um, agri agricultural land use, hydrology, the streams, uh, national scenic wild rivers, wetland inventory, watershed boundaries, and then aquifer information. So in May of this last year, the tool was delivered. There was two parts. There was a, a, a tool for installation of the software. Um, and that was the first hurdle, it was uh, using GIS Pro versus ArcGIS. And it, at the beginning, he said we wanted this to be an easy to use guide. And that's the, that's the thing is it really turned out that it wasn't because you have to be kind of a GIS advanced user to use it. Um, but the, uh, they did provide the installation guide and then, a, and then a kind of a quick start guide. Listed everything down here and it has the system requirements. And my first takeaway when, it, when I got it to run and it took probably eight to 10 hours for it to run through the, all the data and return a result was that it returned a raster image instead of a vector. So it, it wasn't, wasn't smart. It, took, it showed you something on the map, but um, I really wanted to be able to just click on a highway segment and have a value of how sensitive that piece of road is to de-icing materials. So that was uh, one of the things we went back to them with as a beta tester. When they gave it to us in May, of course, New York was a beta tester, Massachusetts, Oregon, and Illinois were also beta testers. Um, and they had similar comments that it was not easy to use yet. Um, the, the mandatory input requirements for it were the uh, local highway inventory, soils, wetlands, and the uh, hyd hydrologic data set, streams and rivers. Non-mandatory were the wells, the uh, critical habitat, scenic rivers, and the land cover. So this is it. I ran it. Um, this is by English Brook in 87. And one of the th things that uh, came to light right away, and you'll see the three colors on this map where red is high, um, yellow is medium, green's low. Uh, it was showing all three conditions on the same segment of highway. So I, that again was something that was, for me, problematic. You really wanna be able to distinguish one versus the other and have a value. Because going back to the how to eat the elephant, you wanna be able to say, okay, what's my top? 15% or 10% of highways that are vulnerable and be able to rank them. If you look a, a little closer, you can see the, in the box above the, uh, 
the minimum inputs there and then you give percentage weight to those. And that was another thing back to them is what, should, out, of, what out of the gate should be those percentages to come up with something that's reasonable and they're gonna, they're gonna come back with uh, answers to that. Part of the loading of it, it actually becomes a module that's called a de-icing support tool and all those layers get loaded in there. And again, that that's, takes time. And once you get them all lo loaded, the data sets, then it's good to go. Uh, the data is nationally available. So that's the idea is any state in the country can use this. Any county, town, village can use this, load their network. So it's a, it's a nat, can be a national standard, which is, which is pretty neat. So this was the first run, and he, he, I just took the Lake George Basin for the watershed. And you can see right away, it's all like, you set a boundary of 100 feet around a roadway, and this just came up with some, some red dots, and it's not real easy to see. You really have to dive down into it, but at least it identified locations. Um, again, with them being raster values, it wasn't the best way to, to see it. And the scale is an issue. So um, the boundary set here is 30 meters, 100 feet. But uh, we'll, we're looking for the next iteration to this to be better. Drove down to it a little bit further into the village. And this is where we looked at it. And you'd say right out of the gate, wait, wait a minute. These are all draining into the lake. How come they're not all red? And a lot of the sections, they, they get overlapped. So you see, like I said, you have those three conditions on one segment of road where it's high, medium, and low. And that was a little problematic, but the next iteration of the tool will be uh, much clearer. And that's the next steps with this, is that uh, we went back to the Clear Roads Committee and they're committed to making this work. And the uh, consultant is, uh, we got an am amendment to the contract to give them a little bit more work to modify these things and, uh, and bring it together. One of which was having it be a vector roadway coverage um, modify the tool so it's automated, so it's not so laborious to load, and it is easier and simpler to use for someone who's not really familiar with GIS. Um, modify the software uh, for that sensitivity score. Uh, create an installation script, so a lot of that, again, is easier to load. Expand the version of the installation and getting started guide. Um, that includes step-by-step ways to use it, and then create a new user guide that explains the layer weighting functions, a place to start, and then how to adjust and what's that, what that's gonna mean. And uh, lastly, it's gonna, um, they're gonna provide uh, instructional videos to companion the getting started guide and the, uh, and the you should guide. And this is all gonna should be delivered by January of this next year. So I went through it really quick, but, uh, any, any questions? Any questions for Joe? I, I want to, my first question now, this is what, three years, two years, three years going? So it's 2019 in the fall. Okay. Yeah, so. And I, I think it's a great, great project. Glad they, they stuck with it. Um, now the data sets that you're using, now some of those like wells may be difficult. It, it's only what is available and we know like right. DEC, or there's no way a lot of the wells in New York State, at least, I don't know other states. Right, so that, are... that becomes an optional input feature. Okay. So there's basically three, the three mandatory layers, which were the soils and the wetlands and the hydro hydrology. Okay. A question over there, I think. Actually, I have a question. Um, have you, we talked, there was a little bit of talk about tree canopy and maybe cutting back some of that to get to the roads. I know you would be kind of coming at the, at the opposite angle of what you're, you're looking at, but have you thought about including some of that, like locations where trees could be cut back to yeah, help that's, lower the salt content and whatnot? It's, uh, it's in, I don't know how it's gonna be measured. It's, it's included as, as one of the 19 variables that can be you know, put into the matrix. Um, I don't know, you know, as far as like the shading on the road where it's going to, you know, show it to be the most um, beneficial, but that's going to be the kind of next iterations and also next iterations and discussions of this 
is ho is hosting it someplace where people can get to it um, across the board and view it. So there's different ARC viewers that are out there. And like I said, that mass tool is an open domain, publicly facing tool that people can go to and, and see where low salt locations are and sensitive areas are. So the problem and, and why Massachusetts wanted to expand on what they have is that uh, this, this is a little bit more detailed in, in far as the analytics of what those segments are. I'll uh, throw another one out at you, Joe. But, you know, I, I really like this. I think it's a great tool. Um, one thing I guess this does not take into account, and not to put more work on you on this to get it to go, but uh, does it take into account drainage, like existing systems? So, like, when you're taking a look at, you know, you had the, the village of Lake George up. I mean, there's a stormwater collection system that it may show that it's, good meaning not an impact to the lake but there may be stormwater conveyance there and i just did not know if that was a tool or not, not yet to, not to no not put yet more work it, on you it's but looking more at the soil type the and soil whether types, it's, okay. it's well drained um, okay. poorly drained you know okay that, that kind of thing but um it's a start and it's a you know next iterations the next generations of it could could you know add add that complexity to it no i like that i think it's a it's a great tool, so, and yeah, it's um, we, we're doing a lot of a lot of great work, and that's a. One and of the with good ones. this grant, now Clear Roads provided grants. Is it a matching grant? Do the states put so funds into it, or is it just the, it's the a, time? Match? It's a pooled fund, so each okay. one of the thirty-seven states puts in money. Okay. Every year. Okay. And that money gets used for research. Any other questions? If not, Joe, I want to thank you. Thanks. I want to thank the department for this too. I think it's, sure. a, it's a great tool. Clearroads.org. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oop. Um, thank you. I, uh, in closing, um, I want to first of all request if everyone could take a look in their packets for the evaluations because again that really helps us. I think we, we had a great conference this year. I want to thank everybody for being here and sticking it out and, and going through the present, presentations. I want to thank all the presenters, maybe a hand for all of the presenters throughout the day and the panelists. Um, also, I want to thank Joe from Innovative. I want to thank James from De-Icing Depot and Steve from uh, Metal Plus and, and the other sponsors, Sawyer from ADK Action, because without their support, you know, um, this really wouldn't happen. So a round of applause for the sponsors as well. Um, I, I get energized every time that this kind of, and relieved actually every time it comes to the end, but um, I, I feel we're getting a better product. I hope that um, uh, came across well over the, the internet and uh, virtual. I need to thank our production crew, Visual Planet, for, for the great work that they did. And there's one person that is out in the lobby that really has put everything together and made this run smoothly. Um, that's Danica Campbell from the LGA. Um, she deserves a big round of applause. So thank you, Danica. Um, so in closing, a couple takeaways that I came and jotted down during the day. Think of buckets. You know, I think the, everybody's going to think of buckets in a different way. Um, but that's a way to break it down. You, you, we, we look at such things as road salt reduction and, and a lot of things as it's such a big task and how are we going to accomplish it. But thinking how that we can break it down into smaller things and to, to whittle that down so, you know, as we go forward, think buckets. And, you know, I heard uh, it takes a community to reduce, it takes technology and partnerships to achieve the reduction. So we're all part of this, the driving community, good discussion on the panel about expectations, um, you know, the partnership and technology. It's great to see that being applied. I remember seven, eight years ago, we were talking about putting tracking units in trucks and we just got the coldest stare that it's kind of like my teenage daughter back home you know she just looking at it like what 
But I mean, that's why, and we're learning from that. The public needs awareness and respect. I mean, I think that's a big thing. I think that's something I feel it should be a discussion point and respect, respect for our uh, operators and that are working those hours under difficult conditions, you know, respect them when they're out on the road. Reactive to proactive, a great um, statement I heard, we need to be proactive, not, not to be reactive, plan ahead, understand the conditions, understand winter severity and how it's coming and, and plan ahead. Just do it, you know, believe in the program. So just get it done, believe in it. It is a cultural change. You know, it's easy for us in a room to tell the operators you should just be doing this. They're the ones that have to go out there, but you know, let's be there to support them. We've always been there as an organization to help support any way we can, uh, even financially. For it to be sustainable, you need a culture of collaboration. So if we want this to happen, if we want it to continue, we all have to come to the table. We have to work towards solutions and work towards compromises and, and how this can happen. You know, and we gotta find balance in the park. Um, you know, a lot of respect for Tracy. I'm glad he came down. Difficult position he's in. Um, and the one question I never got to, and they'll probably be glad, but I was gonna ask about climate change and how's that changing? And we're, we're seeing those changes. How does that change their job? So we need to find that balance and we need to find it for everybody. So um, so those are my takeaways. Ooh, and I said, act now is the last thing. That was uh, for my good friend, Mark Yagi. I'm thinking of the Clean Water Act. So we should all act now, know what's going on, know how to protect our waters and, and help protect our community. So I wanna thank you all for coming. Um, again, talk to the sponsors on your way out, find out some more information. Uh, we will be in touch with the link. These presentations will be available once uh, they get trimmed down and, and prettied up, and they'll be on the Lake George Association website. And please keep in touch with us, and we'll all continue the uh, discussion. Thank you very much.